Hey everybody, welcome again to the Retro Monster Truck Review. My name is Josh Rode. This week on the show, we've got Dan Cheech-Agosh of Crush This, a Monster Truck Podcast, and he come on here to talk about Nashville 1999, another TNM Motor Madness show. We had a good one last week with Orlando 2000, so we're going to keep it rolling here with the Motor Madness feel and go right into a Nashville event. I want to say thank you to everybody that likes, comments, and subscribes here on the YouTube channel, as well as follows us on Spotify and keeps giving us those five-star reviews over there on Apple iTunes. We really do appreciate all the love and support, guys. Hope you all keep it coming. But without further ado, we're going to jump right in here with Dana Gosh for Nashville 1999 TNN Motor Madness. again everybody welcome to the retro monster truck review this week we've got mr dan chichagosh from crush this the monster truck podcast joining us again over here and cheech you told me about this show nashville it's march 20th 1999 a lot of people can refer to this as dennis anderson's revenge show that he had after some uh, setback in orlando earlier in the season and now here we are in a small tight-knit little arena in the middle of downtown Nashville, getting ready to put on a show with eight of the top monster trucks in the country. Yeah, and it is pretty cool because the arena was semi, I guess, new uh, when it came out, uh, especially for the the hockey team that they're going to support. But the the atmosphere of that event uh, televised one of the few arena shows that was going to be televised. I think it was the only. I believe out of the whole season of the TNN Motor Madness Monster Jam, not talking about the TNN Motor Madness that was with USA Motorsports, but I believe with the Monster Jam segment, this was the only arena show that was televised. I think everything else was stadiums. So yeah, that's you're one pretty thing. much right. That's yeah, you're, why you're pretty I was much right with that right there. Uh, yeah. The show opens with Dan Moriarty. And I think it's a funny line. It says, my bosses are all around me. I'm on my best behavior. Sure, Yeah, sure I am. And I can honestly attest to that because last year, Nashville was the first show that I did with Monster Jam. And your bosses were literally everywhere. Why? Because it's Nashville. This That town, I, I'm, I love that town. Music City, USA. You walk in, you're walking down the streets in Nashville after your events and everything. And man, just so many places to go. Country music everywhere. A lot of booze <laughs> and mm -hmm. a lot of women walking around out there. Uh, there's just a, a lot to do in Nashville, and that downtown strip of Nashville is just so much fun. That's why you see a lot of high-ranking monster truck officials usually in Nashville uh, when they have shows there at that venue. Right, right. And the arena is right next to that area. It's called Broadway. Uh, yeah, Broadway. On, I couldn't think of the yep. street name. But yeah, Broadway. Yep. You name it, it is a neon light. It's, it's like a... Uh, like Vegas a little bit in the old 1960s and 70s. Lights sticks out, it signs all around the area, um, but it's a fun place. I never had a downtime, and like you said, uh, with Nashville in previous years, it's always like the first event. Uh, this one, you know, kind of further along the line, but people will be there all the time. We, I had my bosses there um, every single a year when I was working at Monster Jam when I did that show. And it, it like you said, it's just awesome to be around. Fun time. Good food. Oh, very good food. <laughs> yes, very yeah. good food. Honestly, I did a thing last year. I'm, I'm a bit of a popcorn fanatic. A lot of people may not know that. But the very first weekend out was, Na of course, Nashville. And no building's popcorn beat it the rest of the season. Nashville's popcorn. If you ever go to the Nashville arena uh, to go watch a Monster Jam show, which should be one coming up here soon, if you're going to go to one, I recommend the popcorn highly. It is some delicious stuff. I, uh, I've i thoroughly enjoyed it. Also, there are just so many little bars and mom-and-pop little restaurants along the way out there that you can just pop your head into. It's just some really good food. Uh, another thing I can I can compare this to Nashville Super Speedway. I was there years ago for an MLMT event for the crossover racing track. Honestly, that area not really close to the Nashville area. So if you plan on going to like a Nashville Super Speedway event, 
down the road, I would recommend skipping it and saving it for this little uh, arena show that they have. It's and just also, so much more fun. Also, the football stadium, Nissan uh, Titan Stadium, where the Tennessee yeah. Titan plays at, mm-hmm. is across the river from that street. So there's a walking way bridge that's light up. You cross that bridge, you're already on that pathway. So just if anyone wants to go to this football stadium monster truck show that they do in the summertime, you can go along the street Yeah, there. Go, go there. That's another one. I for, completely forgot monster trucks go to that one. But, um, I, man, I got to tell you, I just I love the Nashville area. It was one of those very pleasant surprises that I had while I was on the road last year because, honestly, I wasn't expecting much. And then when I got there, my eyes were open to the awesomeness that is Nashville. And uh, we go to a segment here from Dan Moriarty. He seems like he's his own cheerleader. He's standing in the entrance of the Grand Old Opry, which ends with him awkwardly dancing and then saying, you can't put this on TV, can you? Well, they did, and it was pretty awful. <laughs> We can go. We can just say what we want to about that. But then we run into a uh, a recap here, featuring an iconic quote from one Tom Mintz. Dan says, "Hey, remember the last time we were together? A guy named Tom Mintz and Bulldozer made a guarantee, and it cuts to Tom saying, Grave digger may dig the graves, but Bulldozer covers them over.'" And Dan says, "Well, guess what? You knew it. I knew it, and he delivered it. Tom Mintz was your winner the last weekend out in Orlando and Bulldozer." And Dennis never, ever let him forget, by God, hey, Tom, you only won because I broke a ring and pinion in the rear. One thing that kind of, uh, one thing that bugs me is, well, one on the notes, they refer to Tom as a new kid on the block. They, they, they treat Tom like he's someone new when, in all reality, the guy's been racing monster trucks since 1993. And from 1993 to 1998, he was leading the, no offense to Paul Schaefer, but he was Monster Patrol for the longest time. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, he was the one that was filling up, you know, doing a lot of those tricks of the trade and making kind of Monster Patrol kind of up there. And when they say he's a new kid on the block, I kind of, there's a lot of things throughout here that makes us triggered. But that's one got me triggered because, you know, Tom wasn't really new. You yeah, know, Tom wasn't new at all. Like you said, Tom Mintz was basically the face of Monster Patrol at this point. He'd been featured on Inside Monster Jam quite a few times as well up to this point. And it just seems like, oh, he's the new kid on the block, and he's going to be tracked down by these salty veterans tonight in Nashville. Honestly, the way that they portray some of these drivers in this event when they talk about Tom, to me, they they all just sound bitter towards Tom. And it, it makes almost all the other drivers kind of come off in a bad light as far as I'm concerned and I think that that's something that you should shy away from on a television show especially when your golden golden goose over there with the black and green paint job is doing it yeah and I think they really pushed that along later out the years when he gets into the Goldberg truck and the and the team men's truck they they kind of push him to the point where you know he's this cocky guy when all reality me and you know Tom He's one of the nicest people I ever. I he's one nice, he's the nicest person I ever met. One of the nice people. He's and, always always remembered my name. I interviewed him years ago for AllMonster.com, and uh, it was one of my favorite interviews that I've really ever done. I was nervous going into it. I didn't. I don't really didn't really know Tom at the time, but he made it very comfortable. It was a very good experience. Um, but like I said. He still remembered me this entire time. He remembered me when I showed up in Nashville last year. I looked at Tom across. Like, he showed up just to kind of be a coach that weekend. He did not have a show that weekend. He just showed up to be a coach. He was there for Colton. And uh, I said, hey, Tom, I don't know if you remember me. He goes, Josh Rhodes, I remember you. What are you doing in Nashville? And I'm like, wow, Tom Mintz remembers who I am. And we literally spoke. It's been years since we'd spoken last. But he remembered exactly who I was, and I remember doing the interview with me and everything. Just a class act in monster truck racing, and if you ever get a chance to meet Tom, I suggest you do it. Uh, our intro plays, and we get that fantastic theme song for TNM Motor Madness. I got to say, that is just is one of the things that always drew me in on a Friday or Saturday night whenever Motor Madness played. The weird thing that I get here, though, is this uh, the intro itself playing... But we only really get four highlighted things here in the intro. We get a Gravedigger highlight, which is the clip of Lyle and the accident in Pontiac and uh, night, excuse me, accident in Providence, Rhode Island, 1992. We covered that a couple weeks ago on the show. The next is a pro stadium truck star, Joe Brozovich, who's not on this show, but that American themed 
American flag themed Bronco, always one of my favorites to watch, affectionately called Brozo's Bronco uh, during other seasons of Motor Madness. Like I said, the weird thing, only four clips played. Those are two of them. The next is a quad flying through the air, and then a mud and sand drag car kind of slides up on two wheels, and that's it for your intro. Yeah, that's uh, always their intros are always interesting. And then later along the lines, they try to create different types of uh, segments of the intro and whatnot. But uh, always when I was young, the music was always... Uh, uh, catching for me when i was younger i, I don't know why you, the same way you talk about it but for me it's just like okay it's time to watch it let's go on doesn't matter what episode and you know what drama happens and unfolds i'm ready to watch this stuff and, yeah the, mu uh, the music is amazing the the video package they put to it is not it's not mm. it's just weird uh, i mean yeah you want to highlight one of your best truck which is grave digger obviously but maybe highlight a few a few more of the trucks in the intro would have been nice but, uh, I mean, I will say this. It is much better than the whole Monster Smash final music that they used to play for TNT. And I know Matt Stoltz is listening, and he probably hates that I said that because he loves that music. I don't. <laughs> I hear you on that. I hear you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Moriarty again welcomes us to the show, pointing out that battle lines have been drawn basically in the sand between Bulldozer and Tom Mintz and the rest of the field. He says, this. as soon as he says Tom's name, we get a very quick cut straight to a headshot on Tom Mintz and Bulldozer coming towards the camera, and then another quick cut back to Dan, saying we have pro stadium trucks as well. He put, And then he pitches to the booth to uh, one of the more iconic duos in Monster Trucks, Scott Douglas and Mike Hogwood. These two always had very good chemistry together up in the booth. Right, right. And, and you know, it, for us in the Monster Jam world, we always knew, you know, Scott Douglas is the play-by-play. -play. And then you would have the Monster Jam personnel or or um, Mark Schrader as your color commentator. It's flipped over in these early segments. Uh, no, not early segments. Early segments of Monster, M Monster Jam Motor Madness. Mike Hogwood was always the play-by-play. -play, and Scott Douglas was the color commentator. And some of the iconic roles that Mike Hogwood always say, like, sick air! Yeah. And, you know... <laughs> And some of the stuff that he I've said. I've got some great air from yeah. World Finals, yeah. You know, um, it was awesome hearing them. Uh, you know, God rest his soul with Mike, you know, and passed away a few years ago. But um, for me, it was always awesome to hear those guys and Dan. And, and then, uh, you know, sometimes they add some uh, lady into the situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, she tried. And... <laughs> Yeah. Yes. She would definitely get the sticker that's just the star with you tried in the middle of it. That would definitely go with her. Uh, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but I, every time she was on TV, I just kind of shook my head sometimes. Uh, just for preference here, I remember the World Finals interview they had with Scott Hartsock talking about how Scott had hurt the truck. And she goes, is your car injury going to hurt you? As soon as those words came out of her mouth for a monster truck, I was done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't need to hear from her ever again. But anyway, we scoot on here and we get Mike talking to us about how we're getting closer to deciding a champion on this tour. Mike and Scott are here in front of an obvious green screen, but it kind of, it's a really well done green screen. I will say that it was kind of hard for me to pinpoint exactly what it was, but uh, you can see him kind of standing in front of what they're trying to make it look like they're there live calling this with that green screen crowd in the background. It's a very well done green screen. It's a lot better than some of the green screens I've seen in 2021. We'll put it that way. Uh, Scott Douglas then points out tonight's track is a roundy round. What's wrong with just calling it a Chicago style track? That's my personal preference. I, I don't understand why they would do that, but you hear that term throughout this entire night, roundy round, Chicago style chase track. They, they say it multiple different times and we're, I don't know, we're about five minutes maybe into this broadcast. We've yet to see a truck on track. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they uh, try to, you know, explain about the scenario of the track. And I, for me, it gets a head scratcher is why are they treating this thing like it's a new thing? You yeah. know what I mean? That, this, once again, has been going on for a while. And uh, they're, they're treating like this has never been done before. The way... The way They've been explaining it. It's like, oh, this is a first time. It's like, 
No, it has not. I mean, you guys did an episode in Providence 92. That's, yeah. they, you know, they've been doing that roundy round stuff, Chicago stuff since back in like, you know, whenever, you know. And yeah, the, the Chicago style, we'll put it this way. Chicago style has been around a long time and I don't understand the whole re- calling it roundy round. I guess that's maybe a slang term that some other guys would use in the pits. But Chicago style was always generally what you would hear it called as on TV. Uh, yeah. We finally get into our field of trucks here. And I'm immediately triggered by the first thing. Equalizer, they say, is a new guy, kind of, on our tour here on TN- TNN. Uh, and he's he's one who I think can handle this course really well. As soon as he says a new guy, I'm immediately triggered because we know David Morris is in the 1989 World Championship truck. Mm-hmm. And it just, you you're catch a theme with this, the Motor Madness uh, guys, is they're, they're they're treating it like these guys haven't been here before. Yeah. Um, you know, if you guys been a fan of the Motor Madness monster truck scene back in, you know, 97, he won the championship in 97. He won the King of the Hill title for USA Motorsports in 1997. Mm-hmm. You know, he ran throughout the 98 season. Obviously, I think he is con- he was contracted uh, when USA got bought out by Monster Jam or United States Hot Rod back in the 98 to 99. He gets into the flow of it the same thing with like the hall brothers with executioner and obviously bulldozer because bulldozer was owned by usa motorsports at the time before mm-hmm. that they got transferred over to monster jam or united states hot rod it was through that ordeal and uh and once again he's not a new guy he's been here for a while he he won he won two titles previously from 97 and you know it, it, it's uh you know and they, they they still say you know um, he's a new guy, and that really bugs me when I even watched it about him saying that too. And uh, uh, they need to give props where it's due. And yeah. I I don't and like that, it when they like I said about immediately it. as soon as they said new guy, I was like, all right, who produced this? Because they need to be like reprimanded for it. I know it's years later, but I'd still like to grab the guy by his shoulders and shake him. Anyway. <laughs> we move on. Monster Patrol. Obviously trying to make up points on Gravedigger in the points battle. Paul Schaefer doing the driving duties for Monster Patrol. One thing that we notice, they do talk a lot about the a lot about the points, but I don't notice at all in either of these broadcasts. That for some reason this took two shows. But uh in either of these broadcasts, I don't see them ever one time show the actual point standings. No, they didn't. They always talked about it. And during the ninety nine season, they always did two show programs. Uh, you know, the round one, two, and then maybe three, and then they'll do semifinals and final round. But like you said, I agree. I had I didn't see point standings. I just knew that Gravedigger was in the lead. Yeah, that's all they would say. <laughs> Gravedigger's in the lead. Uh, we move on. Predator is here tonight. Alan Pizzo looking to make a name for himself. Again, another truck that has clearly made a name for itself in the sport. It's still around today, and Alan is still driving the truck. But here in uh, 1999... Arguably, Predator's at at its peak. With Predator, like you said, he doesn't need to make a name for himself. He was really, really a popular truck. During those time periods, he was making crazy moves during freestyle. Then later on in the seasons, he was in the How Many World Finals. And, you know, he also done a lot of competitive uh, racing. They're, they're not giving the respect as it do when Allen's been racing this truck for a long time and has been a very popular truck if he wasn't that popular he wouldn't be in this lineup exactly and we move on we go to barefoot trying to recover from a sluggish season uh they'll mention here a little later about barefoot sluggish season and we'll get to it whenever they get there todd frolic behind the wheel of course Uh, i want to point out todd frolic actually is an rc racer and he's actually around in our area i don't know if you know that cheech Mm -hmm. actually does dirt oval rc racing and he does it in the St. Louis area, and he's very, very good at it as well. Uh, I remember he was at a Brownstown, Illinois race uh, years ago. As soon as I saw him there, I was like, oh, I got to go home real quick. So I ran home, and I grabbed my RC Gravedigger truck. And, of course, I brought it up there. I was like, hey, Todd, what do you think of this? And he immediately wanted to know where I raced this thing at. And on, honestly, if Todd ever listens to this, hey, Todd, we'd love to have you come to a Trigger King event. I got a few trucks you could drive. Anyway, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, still, he has told me to. Um, he did a little bit of a uh, racing, I believe, in Florida for the time, uh, for once in a while. He brings his RCs down there, and he does. It's pretty cool knowing that you know a fellow monster truck driver and is also doing RC stuff. Yeah, a guy that's also a legendary name, driving, of course, barefoot, grave digger, among others. Uh, we go to Samson here. They say he's fourth in points, trying to make a move up there as well. Not much else to say about Dan Patrick at that point. Bulldozer. How about Bulldozer? Bulldozer's been doing and running some well in some races as of late. We'll see what he can do on this roundy round course. We already know what Tom Mintz can do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why they have to say that. But anyway, Carolina, Carolina Crusher, Gary Porter, always a contender on these kind of courses. They are not wrong there at all. And then of course they save Gravedigger for last. They say Gravedigger. Here's the favorite exclamation for here's the favorite. That's the grave digger, Dennis Anderson, trying to get closer and closer to a championship. And honestly, Dennis is trying to get closer and closer to not only a championship, but his first championship, his first world championship, you would say, here on this $100,000 points tour. Uh, and honestly, it's something that a lot of black and green wrecking machine fans have been looking forward to for a very long time up to this point, and that's Dennis Anderson winning a championship. A lot of heartbreak in TNT. A lot of heartbreak in any series that he ran after TNT, whether it was USHRA, USA, you name it. A lot of heartbreak for the digger as far as points championships goes. We all thought he might get one in 1993 during the Monster War season. He led a good chunk of that standings in that season all the way up until the very end of it when Barefoot kind of snuck in in the last few races and stole it from him. But here it is, 1999. Dennis has been racing since 1982, and he has yet to win a points championship. Yeah, and the way they're also kind of pushing this is he's getting closer. His truck, him and Digger 12, uh, really consistent throughout the whole season in 99. And uh, he pretty much been, you know, kind of dominating throughout the whole season of 99. And, uh, uh, you know, you throw in the pinion going out of Grave Digger. He was, I think he would have took out Bulldozer Orlando. And uh, I I think so. Um, I don't know. I mean, when you look back at that race, Tom had the lead coming out of the corner. Dennis would have had the momentum. It would have been tied at the line. It's one of those ones you can't really call if the truck yeah. stays together. But it, everything was playing for him uh, going good. I mean, but uh, like you said, you know, with the trials and errors of you know his season in '92, where you know he got injured, he could have had a good mm -hmm. shot. 93, he kind of uh, met his, you know, demise later on in the year of the Monster War season. Um, I remember one episode you kind of compared Dennis as the Dale Earnhardt kind of monster truck racing. And the championship was kind of his Daytona 500. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, even though he won the championship in 99 and thought that was pretty cool, but in the Monster Jam world, you know, the 04 racing title at Vegas was, you know, you saw the, all the emotions of him in that. But this right here, I think you you could still uh, hear his interview from the St. Louis show. Uh, he had some emotions about that. But, you know, this, this is, you know, everything is falling down perfect for Dennis. And uh, he did a little stumble at Orlando. And uh, this is kind of the event that is just supposed to you know, put him back on the top of the mountain. Yeah, and, and they don't hesitate in telling you that Dennis is trying to get the flag, a thing that they had in TNT Motorsports back in the day, the old silver flag they used to have. Here, it's a checkered flag that's sitting on the back of Bulldozer, signifying the winner of the last event, and that, of course, is what's on the back of Tom's truck, and that's what Dennis wants. Dennis says a few times in this episode, whenever they're, they, they just cut to a quick little clip of Dennis, he basically wants Tom to present him that flag. Like, here you go, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. kneel down and hand it to him kind of thing. Uh, I thought it was a good rundown of the trucks. I enjoyed the fact that each truck got mentioned on TV and each truck got shown on TV, unlike the style of intros that we have now, where it's just uh, a row of names, a face, uh, the driver, and the truck name. They I'm just sorry. touch on a couple of them. They don't go all the way through the lineup. They don't show you all of the trucks until to actually get to see him on TV. And now there's so much going on. An hour is just not enough to show what's going on on television these days. Anyway, before we go into a whole sidebar on that, yeah. let's get back <laughs> over here to retros. Yeah. And now we go from the introduction of the trucks 
to the full-on field of favorites. We only have eight trucks here. We just introduced them. Now we're going to get another introduction of uh, what they would believe to be this, the, I think it's five or four or five trucks that they feel are the favorites tonight, no matter what. Well, I feel like they should have done all eight because well, this was a stack lineup. Already. That's what gets me. They did yeah. the whole intro of all the trucks, and now, well, here's the favorites. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know if you could have a, a favorite. I guess you could say Dennis, but and or Tom, or but everyone in that lineup could, if they had a good run. They could win the event, and people may not forget. But this was a this wasn't I believe this wasn't a one and done event. I think this was also Friday to Saturday. Yeah, I think it was a multiple weekend event. They just only cover this one show, Mm -hmm. but what a show they're covering! Like I said, we're we're not even into the racing yet. We're just covering all the beginning intro stuff that they have right here, and this is a lot to get through. Uh, we got Dan Patrick. Dan says, hey, it's more about finesse, driving ability, and brutal than brutal horsepower. The last turn is all about horsepower. If I pay attention to what I'm doing, run the truck hard, and not make any mistakes, we'll, we usually come out on top on this kind of racing. They cut over to Paul Schaefer. I've got a little problem with my truck. It's been running good. The motor's running good. Brand new motor in it. And I love how he draws out the and. <laughs> Uh, I believe the truck is able to do it. We'll see. I've got Gravedigger first round. Look out. I'm going to kick butt tonight. Dennis Anderson, hey, I'm going to give it my best shot. All I got to do is keep my cool and make those turns nice and easy, and I'm going to get my flag back. Says that a lot during this event. Tom Mins, I'm not going to worry about who is in the other lane. I'm going to go out there and give it all she's got. Ain't nobody going to leave nothing out there on the track, but maybe some destroyed parts. Classic Tom Mintz right there. Mm-hmm. A good classic Tom Mintz interview. A good classic Dennis Anderson interview. Uh, one thing that I don't like about this is they immediately reveal, hey, Paul Schaefer's truck's got a problem, and Gravedigger in first round. They just blew blew who one of the first round matchups right there, and qualifying hasn't even been shown yet. Mm-hmm. And and we'll get to it on the quali- the qualifying car bugged me a little bit also, um, but we'll talk about that later. Paul Schaefer, like he said, has a problem with his truck. He doesn't tell us what it is. He then immediately states that he's running good with a brand new motor. Like, if you have a problem with your truck and then you turn around and say, but it's running good, it doesn't make that doesn't make any sense to me. Completely contradicts himself in a matter of two seconds. It's kind of like and, a NASCAR guy doing an interview. What happened to you on turn four? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, come around the turn. I don't know, and, that guy hit me. Uh, <laughs> and obviously everyone knows that he got hit. But yeah. how he said it is like, I don't know what happened. Well, I don't know. And, it, and it, then it, straight up explains what happens. <laughs> yeah, it, it was weird. I don't understand why they didn't just say what was going on with Moss Patrol. But then again, Dan Patrick talks about finesse and driving ability being key, but not brutal horsepower. Then goes on to say that the last turn is all about horsepower. I get what he's saying, but I think he worded it wrong. Uh, I mean, the last straightaway is all about horsepower, but not the last turn. I mean, just... He could have worded it a little bit differently, mm-hmm. but again, not a major gripe. But Dennis Anderson mentioning he wants his flag back, and then points, uh, then to point this out on the show, we're, in, we're still a little under five minutes in. Uh, no one except him has mentioned that there's a checkered flag on the back of Bulldozer signifying the most recent weight race winner on the circuit. This is something that, TNT, like I said, TNT had done this. They've adopted this flag. Nobody on this show up to this point has mentioned that there's a flag on the back of Bulldozer that Dennis wants to get, and that's something that Dennis has to mention himself. And we still don't get an exclamation after the full-on segment is done. I think they were trying to rattle someone's cage, or maybe the, the when I say rattle someone's cage, I think he's trying to make the people cause drama. Oh, yeah. oh my God, it's, I, the, it's, I, the, it's going on. Yeah, you know? I, I understand that, but they could have said something about the flag earlier on. That's my mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We finally head into qualifying here, and we go into Moss Patrol and Equalizer staging. Paul Schaefer said earlier on that he's got great during round one, so we know who he's facing. So the interview was obviously taped before qualifying. Uh, we move into a segment, though, as they're showing these guys line up called How It Works. Another segment to <laughs> start this show off makes no sense they could have got this whole racing bracket in on this one show but they have this whole segment right here it just it, this just doesn't make any sense to me to go into this how it works segment but then we get a shot of bulldozer turning and various line lines pointing to parts on the truck which makes me chuckle because it's a front engine and they point to the middle of the truck for the exhaust headers mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the segment itself they show highlights of the tacoma show featuring a roundy round track 
uh, with the famous dumpsters on each end of the track, a USA Motorsports thing. So it's it's a different style track that they're showing here, not necessarily the one that we're about to see. I, I get the explanation. I get the explanation, but they could have used a track like a, a different. I mean, they've got multiple, multiple events they could have pulled footage from to show here the show this style of track and they go to tacoma dome <laughs> to show the dumpsters on each end i don't know how they did you know footage wise but you know i guess they take whatever footage they can get to put it in uh they could have done other shows like rosemont horizon uh you know other places that were popular with the chicago style but I- i'm i'm just trying to you know, understand why they used to come. I saw that, and it's like they could have used a different track. Yeah, they could, they could have shown something different. I mean, they could have went all the way back to Providence '92 and shown that track. Granted, there's a few more cars on that track, but it's still more towards the show that we are about to see mm-hmm. than this giant stadium show, which what the, the Tacoma show was. Uh, we get a little segment here. They're talking about, of course, the roundy round track. Samson and Barefoot are shown racing each other here. Uh, and then we cut back, we call it roundy round, we call it chase racing to describe this track. Dennis Anderson finally, uh, excuse me, then Dennis Anderson finally calls it what it is in the Chicago style, explaining the course. Trucks not featured on this show are shown here for some reason. We get Virginia Giant, I think Blue Max, Cyborg, Reptoid, and Gunslinger are all shown here. Then we cut into Dan Moriarty asking questions. Chicago style, what does that mean? And Alan Pizzo Oh, that's just a nickname they gave that gives us for roundy round racing. Well, roundy round to me is Chicago style. They're just they're throwing nicknames around for every bit of this. Uh, Nan says, "How come?" And Alan says, "I'm not exactly sure." <laughs> <laughs> Dan says, "Chicago style. That's like a pizza. What does what does Chicago style mean?" And Todd Frolic says, "Good pizza too, man." Just referring to <laughs> Chicago, I guess. It's just dumb. And then we move on. Uh, some drivers seem unsure about where the name exactly came from, except David Morris. Mm-hmm. David says, basically says he knows exactly where this started. It started at the Rosemont Horizon. This was the first place that they'd done a roundy round track or Chicago style track like this. And the name stuck. And Dan says, okay, where's his award? He's the first one that actually got the answer to the question. And David says, well, I was there the first time they done it. Kind of obvious kind of why he got the answer right, because he was there. I don't know why they just didn't have him explain it, and we could have been done with the whole segment. But anyway, we had to we had to hear White Todd Frolic talk about how good Chicago pizza is. Yeah, they they talked about all that. You know the, the <laughs> you know the, some of the questions were head scratching, and some of the footage, like you said, um, I'm gonna go back to the the footage of Virginia Giant and Blue Max. That's some of the footage they used in the old in the USA, Motor Madness Monster Jam, a monster truck segment that was in the following year and they were using some of the footage obviously they were using a ford big blue ford truck from st louis uh that recent to use footage because of a breakup in a partnership but anyway um you know asking these questions there's a question later on uh we talked about um Mm -hmm. well one thing i want to get to before we go in we we go into all of that with dan We get, we get another thing from Dan here where he, he just kind of turns to the camera and he goes, guys, he's the first one who actually knew what Chicago style was. It wasn't a pizza. It's actually a way of racing that comes, a way of racing that comes from the Rosemont Horizon. This man, David Morris, himself of Equalizer, the rest of them, they had no idea. And he calls them all cement heads. Like, you're the pit reporter mm-hmm. and you just, you're talking down about everybody. I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand that whatsoever. Uh, I, I understand it's, it's kind of, maybe maybe to an adolescent it would be funny but to me it was like why are you insulting the drivers that didn't make any sense to me uh dan seems frustrated no one actually knowing this and then closing out the segment david morse is just kind of standing there smiling awkwardly while he goes on his little rant and then we finally we're finally getting into qualifying dan but wait there's more (laughs) qualifying will be done in a straight line what sense does that make that makes no sense to me only one driver took full advantage of that. Yeah, you're pretty much right. One driver takes full advantage of it. Moss Patrol and Equalizer are the first pair out. We've seen them. They were staging before this segment started. Mm-hmm. Uh, something I found to be a little odd is the drivers never really get a chance to feel out this track doing this. It's just We're just going to go straight into round number one afterwards. Um, what we What we really get here... 
quick straight line shot for these guys. We never see their times. And also, after every single one of these qualifying passes, they don't say it's qualifying on the little graphic. They pop up and say round one winner, round one winner, round round one winner. I mean, how difficult is that to put in your broadcast qualifying time down at the bottom? They'd probably be using the same stuff over and over again. Uh, I don't think... I don't think the rest of the shows, the stadium shows, were ever qualifying. I think they were just going straight to round one racing, and maybe they just went off and used that. It could have very well been that as well, but at the same time, it was just negligence. I mean, this would be like, hey, you know what, NASCAR, we're going to go out on the back stretch at Talladega, and your fastest speed is going to be your speed that we qualify you on. We're not going to use the other three quarters of the track. Right, 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 right. And then we'll just go on a 500 lap race. Exactly. And we're going to expect you guys to turn too, by the way. Just, just, you already qualify you on the backstretch. Makes no sense to me. David Morris gets a little bit more TV time here. Uh, David, we got the world championships going before this race, doing the roundy round. This is Dan talking, by the way. Dan so Dan says, Meets and Anderson were over, I think, about nine minutes into this show now. He said Tom Mintz's name 600 times to this point. But for some reason, he's got to call him Meats here instead of Tom Mintz. Both both guys have to watch out for this guy on this course, and that's the equalizer. Uh, David says, normally we're pretty tough here on the turning course. We're trying something a little bit different. The suspension, we've got a dual-rate shock system, a dual-rate spring system here. Uh, it tends to give the truck a little bit more body roll when you go into the court, when you go into the corners. Uh, we're looking for the truck to be a little better in straight line racing. I don't ex- I don't know what to expect out to tonight. We'll just have to try and see. And Moriarty follows this up with a very generic question. Besides the truck, though, what is it about your driving that helps you excel on this course? Well, David gives a very generic answer. He says, well, years of experience and being familiar with the truck. And Dan, come on, it's not that easy. You look at this thing. It's a 7,000-pound animal. Wrong, by the way. Oh, it's just experience. It's got to be more than that. David finishes out the interview. He kind of he stalls for just a second, but he finishes out the interview. He says, "Well, you know, it's it's kind of like when you was in school when you lean back in your chair legs, and you don't know whether you're going to fall over or not. That's what it's like about the whole time." I don't think David knew how to answer Dan's thing right there because Dan comes back at him and just basically berates him. Mm-hmm. I know he's trying to be jokey and fun, but he basically berates David Morris here, and I don't think Morris was expecting it all. And and also, you tell the frustration that Dan was having towards him. You may not, the average people may not know that there was some frustration, but there was some frustration coming from him. And I'm guessing that that previous question he asked about the the roundy round in Chicago went from because it's the same camera angle, same everything. Yeah, that when he asked same, him, basically the same interview. They just yeah. slice it for different portions of the show. Uh, Dan came off kind of like, uh, you know, you shouldn't be here. You yeah. know what I mean? He just he came off so bad in that that little rant right there that he did mm-hmm. for David Morris. I'm like, this man has won a 1989 World Championship. He won a 1997 Championship in USA. He knows what he's talking about. He literally told you, hey, we're trying something different out in the suspension. We're trying a dual rate spring system here. He gave you a ton of information to work with for your next question. You follow it up with a generic question. He gives you a generic answer and you're upset at him. Even yes. a novice interviewer at this point, I'm SJ on our tour last year, she could hear what the drivers were saying and come back with a question immediately referring to what they were just talking about. If it was a technical question, that's something that I'll always, always love Sarah Jessica for. She knew exactly what she was doing out there. Dan, he just completely ignores everything that David Morris says here about the suspension. There are a ton of questions he could ask about that dual rate spring system. Why'd you go to it? What made you want to change? What, what is this? What is that? What, what makes this different than a single rate spring system? No, you immediately come back with a generic question, get a generic answer, and you want to berate the driver. Right. You could have been to have a more intelligent question instead of, how are you so good at this place? Uh-huh. Exactly. He, like I said, he mm. gave him a ton of information to work with for his next question, and he just completely ignored it and went with a generic mm. one that he probably yeah. already had in his head. And he wants to berate. De- and, and don't get me wrong. I know, like I said, I know he's trying to be funny, 
mm-hmm. but that I don't know that just as soon as I I listened to that I had to stop typing notes for a few minutes. I don't know why it triggered me so much. It was like watching Paul Tracy and uh, Haley Deegan last weekend in the SRX race. For some reason, that triggered me, too, whenever he blocked her off a couple of times. And then when she finally dumped him, it was like an explosion of emotion for me. I was like, good, get him. But -hmm. we don't get that here. (laughs) And then he talks about 7,000 pounds. And and, uh, it, it just seemed like, you know, it was just awkward. Yeah, it was just a whole awkward interview. And like I said, we're eight minutes in here. We're eight this minutes a... into this broadcast. We're almost an hour into our recording session right here. And we've only talked about eight minutes. So we've got to really scoot this on. Yeah. I mean, this show, yeah, like this... I said, there's a lot here that's going to trigger us, guys. This, uh, is so the longest... <laughs> <laughs> this is the longest staging also between two monster trucks. Oh, God. Between, yeah. monster... <laughs> between monster Troll and Equalizer. They've been staging they... since four minutes into the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mike that, Hogwood describing qualifying, too. Uh, we're not eliminating anybody in this round. It's simply determining the bracket, which means, for instance, you wouldn't want to go against Gravedigger in the first round. You want to meet him in later rounds. If he would have just stopped, we're simply determining the brackets? Fine. But then he wants to talk about like going into later rounds. I don't know why he does that. Uh, he's not wrong. However, we are, like I said, we already know that Monster Patrol has Gravedigger first round. Scott Douglas then reminds us there's points on the line in qualifying, which would have been nice to know at the beginning of the show. To determine a championship for a season that's got 100 grand to the winner. But, Our graphic, like I said, shows us down at the bottom of the screen here, round one. And to me, I, I typed it into my notes, get your together, mm-hmm. production people. I mean, my God, we're, we've said 20 times we're in qualifying. You put round one on the damn graphic. But anyway, Equalizer has a bit of a bounce on the rear. Hey, we just saw a qualifying pass, Dan. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah! Pass. Equalizer has a bad bounce over over the uh, the cars there. Doesn't really do much. Uh, Mike says, there you go. Look at Get a good look at the shocks on Equalizer. Apparently, Dan Moriarty, you should have pointed to Dan on the floor and said, look at the shocks. But anyway, uh, he does know how to run around this on this roundy round course. Why do you say that? He knows how to run on this roundy round course. He just qualified in a straight line. He ran the truck in a straight line, and you tell, oh, he's really good at the roundy round course. That doesn't help. It doesn't. That doesn't help at all. It's just another it's thing. It's very, very know. confusing. Exactly. Multiple, multiple replays here. We get like five, six different replays of each truck. Uh, yet no qualifying times, but we have enough time to show all of this, all of these replays. Uh, like I said, Moss Patrol doesn't. Moss Patrol has a good run here. It's not overly impressive neither neither truck really was to be perfectly honest with you uh barefoot and predator up next we're reminded at the start of the season todd frolic won on motor madness which was the houston show since then he's had a rough go of things barefoot won over uh pablo huffaker and gravedigger in the astrodome in the in the first broadcast of the season scott says this is not a race right now they're both qualifying leaning back in my chair (laughs) they've literally said this 16 times by now they're literally Four trucks into qualifying. And they keep on mentioning the stuff over and yeah. over and over again. Seems like everyone that's watching this show must have, like, bad memory. Worse than a bluegill fish. Exactly. And, uh, you, you remember that, uh, oh, what movie? Was it 51st Dates? Where they he runs into the dude with, like, the five-second memory. Hi, I'm Tom. Oh, it's nice to meet mm-hmm. you. Hi, I'm Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> like, what okay. we're going through right now. Remember, it's only straight line racing. For qualifying, remember. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> only it's also a chance to get some one upsmanship going in uh, to the next round from Scott Douglas, which would be true if we were running the whole course, but no, we're not. Uh, we're reminded again this is a timed qualifying run again, and we're shown yet again this is round number one. Come on, guys! I like hearing Scott Douglas speak as much as the next guy, but come on, uh, barefoot through the straight line situation here is known for its horsepower and its Keith Black Hemi engine. Wait a second. Barefoot's graphic earlier said it had a 572 CID engine, he, Hemi with 1600 horsepower, and Predator had the Keith Black. So they got that a little messed up right there. Again, we're shown qual- we're shown the qualifying passes with a multitude of replays, no times. I have no idea who's the fastest at this point. Going into Bulldozer and Samson, we're reminded Tom Mintz is dominant so far this season. Mintz has won, quote, every single race he's been in. That's not been televised. And of course, he won here one week ago in Orlando. Of course, he famously beat Dennis Anderson with the ring opinion coming out with an old digger number 12. Uh, we're told here that Dan Patrick has 25 years in the business, 15 years in competition. Someone should fact check that because I don't think that Dan started driving until 1989. That's correct. 
So, I think so yeah, when you bought the Samson two truck. Yeah, I, I don't know their their fact checking right there it needs to be checked. I think we need to get Facebook on that. But anyway, again, multiple replays. Bulldozer is said to have the faster time, but they sure do talk up Dan Patrick a lot here. Douglas even mentions that he's probably one to watch out for on tonight's course, which is a very true statement, by the way. Dan Patrick knows how to get it done on a Chicago style racing track. Uh, coming up next, we get veterans battling it out, aka the two headlining trucks. I would say Gravedigger and Carolina Crusher. Getting ready to qualify here. Porter is interviewed here. He does a fantastic job describing the event, saying it's basically the eight best trucks in the country at this venue. And I agree with that to an extent, but there's a certain blue truck we were talking about earlier that is not in this field that really would have made this field a little bit more something uh, to mm -hmm. be said. Um, we go into Grave during a Carolina Crusher here. I got to point out, you can hear the crowd cheering. I don't know if they piped these in. I highly doubt it. But there's a lot of cheers for the Grave Digger truck in Nashville. And I can attest to this. When I was in Nashville last year, Kristen Anderson, that black and green truck pulled on the track. They didn't care who was driving it. They sure do love their grave digger. And also a little side fact, um, this would be the second week that Gary is driving Carolina Crusher under new ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, in the week prior to Orlando, Orlando uh, I believe the way I was reading it, the week of... Um, he uh, purchased, he sold the team to Paul Schaefer, and this was going to be the basically the second weekend of Carolina Crusher being owned by him. So that was a little fact about that. And this is the race that I was also talking about that um, he the, that uh, someone uh, took full advantage of the opportunity to take advantage of the straight line course to his advantage on knowing what to do with the turns which is pretty cool yeah and of course that's a digger but one thing i want to point out here you're talking about that that's actually a little bit tidbit information i didn't know i thought it was sold in 2000 not 1999 but uh like i said i'm probably wrong on that point it's just a thing that i'd heard years ago uh crowd favorite here grave digger this is digger number 12 this is a longer wheelbase truck it's 152 inch wheelbase whereas the other digger trucks were 132 inch wheelbase this is also the first truck that we saw the purple get in, in into the paint scheme of the grave digger the name looks a little different on the side of it uh i'm kind of glad they they changed the name up just a little bit and moved it back to what it was I'm not a fan of the, the, the Gravedigger name on the side of this paint scheme, but I really am a fan of integrating the purple in there. The skull on the side of this is one of the best-looking Gravedigger skulls that ever was painted by Fred Buman. I love the fact that the windshield is actually sloped back a little bit on Digger 12. It gives it a more aerodynamic look to that 50s panel van. Uh, man, number 12 was also Adam's one of Adam's favorite trucks. Oh, yeah. And it was, uh, and also was his first, uh, not counting Pablo's, but it was one of Dennis's first trucks running the Night Stalker nitrogen mm -hmm. shocks. Yeah, good point. Compared yeah. to the coilovers that he would normally run, uh, you know, P Pablo ran those type of shocks in his trucks long beforehand. But Dennis never really did. He always ran the coilovers uh, that but he Dennis ran. Dennis is stepping out of Digger number seven to hop into this truck. This is a mm -hmm. drastic change for Dennis. Like you said, 132 inch wheelbase, completely different shock setup. Now we're moving into a Night Stalker shock setup on a 152-inch wheelbase truck. And he's driving Something in the center. Probably, I mean, yeah, and he's also driving in the center of the truck as well. Completely different from number seven. Don't be wrong. I love me some digger number seven, but this truck had to be a little bit of an adjustment for Dennis to get used to. But he's certainly shown in 1999 that he's really adjusted very well to it. Uh, Anderson has the better qualifying pass here. Even with the driver's headlight uh, ring, blinking on and off here, so the truck's maybe about 75% with it blinking. <laughs> but Dennis, like we said, jumps the core, jumps, lands, and goes straight into a corner here and jumps the next set of cars. Ta like you said, taking full advantage of it is something that I really like. There, did, nobody said anything about it at the beginning of the show that you couldn't do that. So why not do that really quick? It was a good little chance for Dennis to get a quick little turn to feel the dirt and feel what it would do to the truck. Right, right, and then he got a little, pla he, like you said, uh, he's still a little bit of a practice run uh, prior to racing rounds to take a look at the, uh, you know, the dirt itself. Um, I think the last few events prior to this 99 event, well, I know some guys have rolled over the truck 
uh, and later on in the show, you'll find out that a certain yellow and red truck uh, during freestyle uh, try to make a nice little turn and I uh, dumped it. So um, mm-hmm. that maybe that was one thing that's going over Dennis's head. Uh, you probably know about the history of what now is the Bridgestone Arena mm-hmm. uh, and how the dirt is and everything like that. And yeah, it's uh, pretty tacky there. Mm-hmm. And try to go from there. Going to some pro stadium truck highlights after qualifying. We get Gary MacGyver out here uh, and rollover. <laughs> I love the name of the truck. He does have a very hard rollover right here. Actually pops the windshield out of it. Fluid pouring out of that Jeep. Jim Hopkins is the name that I remember from pro stadium truck racing. He takes Ramrod 2 out here on the track. Actually does better than rollover by making it out of the first turn. Uh, 76 Bronco turns in a 2362. Rory Campbell comes out with his 85 Ram Charger, skying those jumps. A couple very hard landings to draw out each, uh, to draw out an ouch from each of the two announcers. Uh, much wider wheelbase than the rest of the competition, but turns in a respectable 2578. And then coming back from commercial break, we get a preview of what's to come on the USHRA Monster Jam Tour. Some famous events listed here, Dan. Salinas, California, Syracuse, New York, Hagerstown, Maryland, and of course, West Lebanon. I do also like, that's one thing I did like about the Motor Madness Monster Jam shows is they told you, you know, the list of events. Um, you know, you, you you may not have a chance to go on back then when the show came out. You know, access to internet was not as accessible as it is today. Mm-hmm. You know, you may get lucky enough to finally go on the internet if schools had it you know it was introduced in the schools so the best way to find out pretty much is if you watch commercials of your local you know television or if you're watching monster trucks we'll go ahead and tell you what's up so yeah, hey we'll tell you when the when this stuff's coming to your hometown which is a great way to promote your events uh they use it to their full advantage here we mm-hmm. go into some more tough trucks here and we get thomas ray white twister three a name i i very much remember from these days in monster jam very famous name in pro stadium truck racing as well and he's ripping up the track here sets uh so far which would be the second quickest time 2391 uh S- san sutter and tough and ugly one of literally the coolest trucks because it was literally tough and ugly uh from the memphis area sports the tennessee national championship football flag on the truck catches a crush car on one of those jumps and scores a 24 53 steve hopkins brings out the original ramrod Lost a lot of the time in the turns, and then does uh, one of the more famous crashes you would see on some highlights, and that's an end-over-end rollover that he has at the end of the track. Locks the brakes up, almost does a stoppy, and then just rolls right over onto the nose. Scott points out that we see this style of rollover in the early days of Moss Truck Racing, and the first thing that I really thought of was uh, Crimson Crusher way back in the day in Louisville in 87 when the truck bounces up onto the nose, he hits the brakes, and it rolls over. Very similar Mm -hmm. crash that he has right here. Uh, Jim Hopkins is shown again here for some reason. We just saw Ramrod 2 earlier, but now they're going to show Ramrod 2 again. They don't mention that whether this is a round two pass or what. But he, he goes obviously way faster at a 26 or 2166, a big improvement from his previous time. Then we get the top of the food chain, which is a truck that myself and Mark Fontanetta actually looked at when it was for sale upon many years ago. We very, very much considered listing and buying this truck. Chad Walden actually does the driving duties right here. Does a great job. 2394. It's revealed Jim Hopkins wins the event. It's got to got to be bittersweet for him, though. He wins the event and his other truck's trashed. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's pretty cool to see the highlights of this stuff because also I do believe people still watch the Motor Madness from the last few years and whatnot, and now we get to see, you know, all this uh racing wise but there were some good heads on favorites that weren't at the event yep uh joe brozovich was one of them he's featured in the show open yet he's not here competing in this really competing in this entire tour with the bronco uh monster trucks round one hey dan i want to ask you do you remember when they were talking about that roundy round chase racing chicago style track Mm -hmm. well we're finally going to get to see it Finally, right after this okay. jargon jam segment <laughs> about burnouts and dry hops, we all know what that is. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what a burnout or a dry hop is. Let's be honest. 
get into Carolina Crusher and Bulldozer, and immediately I'm triggered again on this race. We'll talk about it when we get to the finish. We're told how the Chicago-style setup is ran for about the 600th time on this show. Porter's in the yellow lane. Mintz is in the blue lane closest to the tunnel. Both the trucks are cornering very well, sliding right around the pole at the end of the track. And as they cross the finish line, I'm fairly certain Carolina Crusher wins this race by over a half a truck length. But we're told that Tom Mintz wins. We go into replays. Porter looks like he has a very smooth first turn with a little hike up of the rear. And that's what they blame Porter losing this race on is when he hikes the rear up, retire up in that corner. But when he comes around the next time, he's clearly, and I mean clearly, Dan, ahead of Tom Mintz at the finish line. And what makes the salt on the wound so much is how many times they replay both runs for both trucks. It's yes. not like a replay of both trucks running at the same time. They replay multiple times of Carolina Crusher doing its run. Then they replay multiple times of Bulldozer doing its run. Mm -hmm. So they just keep on playing it over and over, which is not helping their point whatsoever on who's winning when everyone can see clear as day that Bulldozer's not the winner. It's Carolina Crusher. Yeah, Carolina Crusher flat wins this race. And they say, well, he, they say multiple times, well, he didn't beat Gary by much. You're right. He didn't beat him at all. It was a very dumb call in a series that is supposed to have a hundred grand on the line at the end of the season. Why are we not reviewing this multiple times? This makes absolutely no sense to me. This is the war, one of the worst calls I've ever seen on a monster truck television broadcast. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's really, it was a head scratcher and it was really, uh, frustrating because I was to be honest with you when I was watching this 99 season I was you know at, at first I was head scratching because I didn't know what happened to Bigfoot but later on when I was reading some of the Chuck World articles I finally figured out what was going on but you couldn't help but not you couldn't help but root for Dennis in the gravedigger and yeah, you couldn't help but root for Dennis and when you're rooting for Dennis and then here comes Tom because they're playing up Tom and, you know, a, you know, 10 year old Cheech is watching this. I'm not really thinking of the big, huge picture. I'm thinking what's going on right now. And mm -hmm. one, I don't like Tom. I never, I, when I, okay, this is 10 year old Cheech, Cheech people. I, Tom's a cool cat. I like Tom. A 10 year old mean didn't. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm uh, the same way. <laughs> I am the same way. When I was growing up, Tom Mintz was like public enemy number one for me on television. <laughs> All right. They treated you, they made him look like the biggest in pro wrestling, they call him heels. Yeah. Tom was the biggest heel. Tom was Kyle Bush. Tom mm -hmm. was off the top of my head, biggest heel right now in Bobby Bobby Lashley. He's He's the, big, the guy that you wanted to hate really bad, and they made him out to be like that. And this is the, kind of the start of this, and I don't know why they did that, because whenever they would interview him, it's kind of like uh, that you used to say this about Mick Foley. He was a heel on television for a lot of his career, but people still liked him because when you looked in his eyes, you could tell he wasn't a bad guy. No, no. And and they pushed Tom to be that way. And then so 10-year-old me goes – all right, Porter beat Muntz. No, they said Bentz won. So I'm arguing with the television. Oh, yeah, you're screaming at the TV at this point. Like, what the hell? What's going yeah. Sorry, Mom, I said hell. But anyway, <laughs> what's going on here? What the <laughs> heck? Sorry, Mom. <laughs> you know, and, and then, you know, the, the situation that comes about there, and then you're, like, worrying because you're like, oh, you know, if, if Tom won this event, you know, what's going on with Dennis? So, you know, yeah, there, for a 10-year-old Cheech, it was a very big drama this episode. Uh, not episode, but in Monster Jam because of, you know, you want Dennis to win. Yeah, and what gets me here is Dan Moriarty, he interviews him and he goes, hey, talk about dialed in. What was that? You couldn't miss. Tom, we run them real good. That's 14 straight wins in a row. Anytime you got Gary Porter, you definitely got your hands full. We were able to get by him. Ain't no gimmies here tonight, all tough runners. If you're going to be here and you're going to be running through these top trucks, you got to gotta be able to run with the toughest. And he's not wrong at all right there. Uh, Dan says, talk about being in a zone. You've won 14 races in a row. Is that a zone? Huh? <laughs> 
I literally, I was like, what? What are you asking him right now? But anyway, he says, I don't know if it's a zone. It's just a combination of a lot of hard work from everybody. Dad, cousin Rob, everybody there pulling together and making it work out. Dan comes back just with, instead of, oh, what about everybody at the shop? Can you talk about everybody at the shop? No, nope, just good driving. We're just going to keep going. We're ready. To, we're not ready to pat ourselves on the back yet. Dan, keep it up, Tom. Just awkwardly inter, like ending this interview mm-hmm. with Tom Mintz. And he's just got this smile on his face that you almost want to reach to the TV and slap off. But anyway, like I said, the last two things that Dan says here are not needed. Good driving. Keep it up. That's a good way to just completely wrap up your interview. He could have said those things together, and then Tom could have ended it right there and been done with it. Also... As we said, Tom clearly lost this race, but they're talking it up here. Like, Dan talks it up here like, my God, you just beat Dale Earnhardt. Yeah, they, I don't know how. I feel like if you were in, uh, if you're a drag racer, you're a rookie and you go out and beat John Force. Yeah, they're, they're really, they're, like you said, they're really prepping up the Tom becoming this heel. And they do a very good job in the next three years. And, uh, and, you know, like you said, 10-year-old Josh, uh, you know, 12-year-old Josh and 10-year-old Cheech. We don't like Tom Mintz. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like... Uh, this just further pushed it on there because it, it, the, we're not... We're, we're young guys watching this, obviously. So when we're watching this, we're not necessarily getting that they're pushing him a certain way. We're getting, oh, by God, Tom should know he lost that race, but he's just... He's cocky. I almost feel bad thinking about that now. Mm-hmm. Hindsight's twenty twenty, I guess, when you grow up. Anyway, next race, probably the wildest one of the night here. Predator and Barefoot, we get a close-up of uh, Bulldozer's nose, or excuse me, we get a close-up from Bulldozer's nose to Predator's, and then we hear Mike Hogwood say, Todd Frolic out of Illinois in that Dodge 572 cubic block engine, because that makes sense. Whole shot to Barefoot in the yellow lane. Frolic is cutting those corners very tight. And then in the far lane, in the last turn, we see Alan Pizzo pull off one hell of a save. Gets it up on two wheels, but he misses the final jump. Barefoot's going to go on to win. And I got to tell you, man, Predator, that save from Predator and that height of a spot in the arena is very impressive. Mm-hmm. And then once again, like they said in the beginning of the show, how he's trying to make for a name for himself. Well, that's the reason why right there that Alan's already had his name already there. And yeah. he knows that truck front to back. He he didn't just, you know, get there just to get there. He had awesome freestyle moves, like the one time in New Orleans where he landed on the tailgate just using a motocross jump. Not motocross yeah. jump, but uh, ATV jump. And, uh, you know, he he uh, he proved that he's an elite driver. Yeah, he proved it right here. With the, the space that he had and the amount of time that he had to pull off the save, it was a very good job by Alan Pizzo. The next bit, though is just another awkward interview from Dan Moriarty. Very awkward. Yeah, that's how I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, well, Alan, is that what you call a bicycle? Well, I think so. What would you call it? It was, a fun, it was a fun ride. Dan, that was one heck of a save. Alan, you got that right. I was driving by the seat of my pants like I told you earlier. And Dan, Alan's going over. That cab is crushed. What? Where does that come out in the interview? I don't know why he says that. Alan, that's what you call good driving. Yeah, I would pat myself on the back there too, Alan. Good job. <laughs> Dan, you feel good? I feel good. You all right? We're definitely all right. Unfortunately, we're not going to make the next round, but we back out for some wild freestyle. So you're not shaky? No, not at all. That's part of living the life, isn't it? Yeah, only me and the laundry right <laughs> I'm sorry, I laugh at this, but Alan does come back and save this segment with this joke. He says, yeah, only me and the laundry lady will know if I was shaking or not. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. Good way to end it. But that was just so awkward. So you're not shaky? No, not at all. You all right? No. I feel good. Are you sure you feel good? Yeah. He told you three times it feels good. And you're just sitting here awkwardly smiling and moving the microphone back and forth to his face. And, he finally, and finally, Alan saves the segment with basically talking about pooing himself line right there at the end. But, man. Yes. That was just two awkward. Questions. Yes. Okay. Two different questions in two different forms. So he talked about, you know, that's one hack of a save. And he said, yeah. And then they ask him, uh, that, that was, uh, let's see here. 
Um, he talks about they talk about both. Okay, what a save, and they end that. But then they say, "Are you good?" Yeah, I'm good. Well, he could have ended it there. Yeah, he could have ended it right there. That could have been the end of the interview. It was awkward enough as it was. He could have ended it right there. Granted, we still we wouldn't have got the line that we got from Alan later on in the interview, but it still would have been a good to end it there because it was already awkward at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We skip over ahead though, that. and we go to Todd Frolic here. He says he lost a rear main seal on the run, but he's not replacing it. He's going to fill it with fluid before every pass, and he'll have bulldozer in the semifinals. Move on to more racing here, or we move on, or we have more racing here coming, excuse me, as we're headed to commercial. But beforehand, let's go ahead and spoil the next run when we see Equalizer going over a turning pole uh, before we go to break. Motor Madness did this far too often. And this is stuff I've talked about in previous episodes where I've said, hey, you know, Monster Trucks have a habit of going to commercial break and basically spoiling what's on the what's coming after the break is over with. This is one of those moments we see Equalizer hitting a turning pole uh, when we come back from break, though, we get to see the crowd favorite, the hero, the icon, Dennis Anderson, and uh, Gravedigger going to be taking on Moss Patrol here. Uh, we hear the sirens of Moss Patrol for a brief moment, and we're told normally we'd see this matchup in the final round, and instead we're getting it in round number one. I agree you would probably see this in the final round if the driver of Bulldozer was behind the wheel of Moss Patrol at this event. Yeah, and already we already know who if they're versus each other anyway because of what Paul said. Exactly. Paul also said that even though the truck's running good, he's got a problem with it. And we do see that there is a big problem with it on that on this run. Scott tells us that Dennis Anderson is embarrassed that he has to stop, that he just has to stop the Tom Mintz juggernaut. But he can't do that unless he beats Moss Patrol. In case you missed it, Porter already stopped the juggernaut in round one. But anyway, Moss Patrol and Paul Schaefer gets a little bit of love on the broadcast here. Uh, broadcast crew, as Scott Douglas points out, that it's grown in popularity over the last few years. Paul Schaefer himself, a former mud racing world champion. Mike Hogwood then immediately says those swamp buggies were something, and Paul Schaefer was one of the best. Yeah, that's another misinformation I remember him saying is there's a difference between mud buggies and swamp buggies. Just like Quite how it is. Just like how the media gets confused between a mega mud truck and a monster truck. Yeah, exactly. That that was just weird of him to come back and say swamp buggies. Obviously, if you know what a swamp buggy is, more power to you. You know what a mud car is? Two completely different vehicles. One's got rice and cane tires. The other doesn't. But it's got paddle tires. But anyway, massive hole shot from Gravedigger here. Digger's halfway over the cars before Paul Schaefer's even over the dirt ramp to the cars. Digger takes the opposite turn. Digger takes the opposite run at the pole as Barefoot did earlier. Barefoot actually pushes the left front tire right up against the pole where Dennis is going out way wide. He's kind of jumping wide, landing and getting more of an arc and more speed coming out of the corners to really push that straightaway and get more speed down that straightaway. And I got to tell you, Dennis almost laps him right here. There's mm-hmm. obviously something major wrong with Mons Patrol, and we're not, like I said, we're not told what it is this entire broadcast. We don't know what's going on with Paul Schaefer right here. But Dennis, like I said, basically almost laps him. Right, and then Dennis is driving... Digger 12 probably differently than 7. You know, yes. he's taking it a little bit wider, but he's using momentum instead of, you know, cutting, using his short wheel base and, you know, tight cornering truck compared to now he's kind of dirt tracking the truck around to get into the position that he's doing because now he got himself a pretty good hot rod. Oh, yeah, he's got a really good hot rod here. And the way that he's taking the course, he is really putting an emphasis on the straightaways and getting the momentum coming out of the corners. It was a very good pass from Dennis here. Uh, And we cut to Dan Moriarty. What a hole shot! No question, no nothing, just what a hole shot. Then Dennis, yeah, yeah, I say, I tell you, it's a tight place in there. The track's hooking really good. The main thing I got to do is stay away from those cones. Uh, If you knock one of them down, you're DQ'd. Tom's got this track down. He's really running good out there in Bulldozer. He's the man I'm after. I want him to surrender my flag to me. That's what I want. I got a feeling there's some pre uh, stuff mentioning in the interview. Dennis keeps on talking about that, and yeah. maybe the honestly people... though, if you know if you know Dennis Anderson, he's probably joking right here. Yeah, yeah, he's joking yeah. right here. But the way that it's portrayed on TV, it almost sounds like he's not joking. And that he basically, he just does not like Tom Mintz. And it's not the, not the case. These guys laugh and smile with each other all the time. 
Mm-hmm. And you'll see it later on, and uh, later on in the second episode when they're face to face before the final round, they're they're smiling at each other. But um, <clears throat> right here, Dan says, with the way that you're running the course, how, how does he word this again? With the way you just ran the ran that run, you're on course on this course. <laughs> that, that was a mouthful for me to get out right there. Mm-hmm. It's like, say that five times fast. With the way you just ran that run, you're on course on this course. That makes absolutely no sense to me. And I think it made no sense to Dennis because he kind of gives him a big bug-eyed look like, okay. And then he says, yeah, I just got to stay consistent out there anyway. Hope hope I can. Truck's running great. Cosmetically, it looks rough. Mechanically, we're running strong. And when he said cosmetically, he's still uh, used, probably using the body that what happened at uh, New Orleans uh early that year when uh he jumped over the try to hit the barricade that split the sand drag yeah, and the truck jumped in the air it. and came down in that horrific nosedive mm-hmm. yeah so i'm i'm guessing that they're still using that body yeah they probably are uh the front of the the front clip actually looks very good on this show but one thing that is noticeably missing is the xii on the front to indicate it's sticker number 12 um Probably a rush job to get a new hood for the truck. But anyway, uh, we get word from Scott that Paul Schaefer is complaining that something blocked the starting light and he never saw the green. Mike says that Schaefer is normally pretty darn good on the start. I'm not sure what the issue is with here with the Monster Patrol truck, but they say it's pro- it's got a problem multiple times. And Paul himself says it had a problem. We never heard exactly what it was, but for some reason they're going to try and blame his loss on the starting light, even though his run was just all over the place right here. Mm-hmm. Dan interviews uh, Roy Jansen, Pace Operations Vice President. Discrepancies on the green light. What was that all about? First off, what kind of question is that for a head official? If a NASCAR driver, or if a NASCAR commentator asked that question to Mike Helton, would they have a job the next week? No. Exactly. No. Roy. No, not at all. Roy goes on to say there was ba- there was some discrepancies on whether Paul Schaefer could see the light. Unfortunately, with our officials, our officials didn't see whether he could or couldn't. With judgment calls like that, it's difficult to go back and recreate circumstances. When we looked at it, the light was visible. I was upstairs, had a view, and I could see the light from where I was. Officials I spoke to felt that they could see the light, they made the call, and will live with it. Seems yeah, like it, a common thing. Yeah, it seems like a common thing here. But one thing I want to point out, just because you were up top doesn't mean that you're in the same view or same area that Paul Schaefer is in. I, I get the call here. I, I actually agree with the call, but he is very to the damn point on his explanation right here on this. Right. He could have just said, hey, unfortunately, we don't have an instant replay rule or something yeah. like that. And quite frankly, it's in kind of the same position as what you were in in Monster Jam in 2020. It was pretty much your call if there's something going on. And you're pretty much in his shoes, Josh. Uh, What happens, happens. But instead of you getting interviewed, the vent director or whoever is running the show is probably going to get it. But still, I mean, you know, the the call, the call is the call. You guys put... In a Monster Jam event, they put the lights out for everyone to see. They're not just going to put lights so anyone not see it. I mean, he's the only one that complains about it. Yeah, everyone else honestly, is not it. Honestly, just looking at this, I almost feel this is a fabricated thing. We don't hear Paul Schaefer say this. Oh, okay, yeah, I forgot about yeah, we that. We don't yeah. hear Paul Schaefer say any of this. But it's talked about. Like, Paul can't see the turning light or the, the starting lights. Okay. To me, it seems like it's just something that they fabricated for TV to try and make Paul look good. I don't know. But uh, I don't know. It's one of those things that's lost the time right now. Uh, we go into the final race around number one here, Equalizer and Samson. These are two trucks that they had pointed out at the beginning of the episode that are very good on this course. And like we said earlier, this was basically spoiled. And when they went to commercial break, Equalizer hits a turning pole and Samson's going to move on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Later on in the next round, there's going to be some little bit more controversy. Yeah, oh, yeah, there'll be a lot more when we get to the semifinals. But anyway, uh, we get some Dan on Dan action here with Dan on the podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> Moriarty basically says, hey, a nice a nice quarter final run. 
but now you've got Digger in the semifinals. Is that a nice award? I like the question. He actually asked a good question here. Dan Patrick says, well, to me, racing, it's like racing in the final round. He and I race a good bit in the winter. I haven't got him on TV. It's a good course. It's a hammer down course, as you can see. I didn't see it, but I think Barefoot almost went over with a little being a little aggressive on the course. It'll bite you if you don't pay attention. Moriarty doesn't correct him, doesn't say anything. Barefoot's not the truck that almost went over. Predator was, but in Dan Patrick's case, he's probably in the back. He heard about it. He probably didn't see any of it. Moriarty just says, Barefoot almost went over, but did you see what Predator did? <laughs> mm-hmm. Predator with Pizzo on board, hanging him on by a thread. I wouldn't call it that. He almost crushed the cab. Patrick comes back with, well, Ego is the most competitive racing out there for a purse, prize money. When it comes down to the serious side of us, it's all about Ego, and there's a lot of Ego here. I don't know where that statement comes from, but he's not wrong mm. at all. Moriarty then says, the thing with Tom and Bulldozer, though, he's won 14 straight races since he's come out here on the circuit, you're probably better off going against Dennis in the semis. And he doesn't phrase that as a question. It's almost an exclamation point that he phrases that as. And he also just completely ignores the whole ego statement that Dan Patrick just made in favor of talking about Tom Mintz's winning streak. He just, uh, just went over on that. You know what I mean? Just went over the head. Way over the head. As uh, (laughs) Jeff Dunham would say, just way over the head right there. Uh, Moriarty finishes basically saying, hey, is Samson holding strong? Minor things, but we're ready to go racing. Moriarty goes all over the place in this interview, from Digger to Mintz to Pizzo to Bull- to Barefoot. Several different trucks, and I'm sure Dan Patrick was just bouncing them all in his head at the time. Semifinals preview. This is another issue that I have with TNN Motor Madness Monster Jam shows. We got the first round of racing, and we got qualifying. But we're going to end this hour broadcast by not giving you a conclusion to this at all. It took so long to actually get in to the Chicago style racing that we got out of it very quickly because we're not going to see the semifinals and finals until the next week's show. And that's the thing that they did in the 99 season is all the events were uh, like that. But the only differences between this and uh, the two differences is one. It was a stadium show. Mm. And two, they had a bigger field than eight. Normally, there was going to be like eight. I mean, normally, it's going to be like 12, 14, 16 truck. Well, yeah. 12 or 14. The 16 truck field would have been the one at the uh, World Finals in St. Louis. So, they they normally, those stadium shows, they would normally have, you know, the round one racing, two racing, semifinals and finals. Semifinals and finals would be in the number two bracket because of round one and round two being so long. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a little bit different because it's half the field. Yeah, you and know? you can tell they had a lot of filler on this episode, and I mean a lot of mm-hmm. filler. Uh, we get a Maalox minute here. It's Steve Hopkins rolling the ramrod over. We get a little bit of a freestyle show with Equalizer. Samson pulling a little power wheelie in this arena, by the way. That was pretty badass to watch. Samson pulling half like half the truck up into a power wheelie across the floor. Uh, next week's episode on here, they talk about we're going to see the semifinals, the finals, and quad wars. Oh, boy. Quad wars. Mm. Week two, yeah. we want to point this out. Week two is currently not available on YouTube. It's not out there. We actually had to go to Dalton Hastings to get him to send us a recording of this so we could watch it go through and do our notes on week two so we can cover the semifinals and finals correctly. So thank you, Dalton, for that. Uh, And if you guys want to see this second episode, maybe uh, comment over on his YouTube channel, Dalton James Hastings, and say, hey, we want to see this, and maybe he'll upload it for you. Uh, The segment we open with on week two is a jargon jam for the term hot shoe. Dennis Anderson and Alan Pizzo don't know what this is, and Tom Mintz says it's someone who wins. And David Morris says, somebody that can't keep his foot off the accelerator at all times. <laughs> Good explanation from David Morris to end that segment. I, I enjoyed that. Right. They, they, um, that was another thing that I could see um, Dan Moriarty getting frustrated. Because I think someone's telling him, go ask someone what a uh, hot shoe is. 
and I don't think that he was getting the answers right. Yeah, he wasn't there getting was the one time, that he needed. The one time Dennis said, Hoppa, that's the gas pedal that I got on my monster truck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hot shoe. Um, yeah, hot foot. Is what I got in the back. It says, on, it says that on my gas pedal. Oh, yeah, it says on my gas pedal, but that's pretty much it. And everything else is was pretty much uh, just head shaking, head scratching, frustration. Uh, I personally thought that it was a little bit funny, but I just thought maybe they could have done something else. I just thought that was a waste of time. Yeah, I thought it was too. But in this episode, we get straight into the semifinals. We got Bulldozer and Barefoot here. Todd Frolic would love to put this feather in his scap. Scott Douglas referring to him beating Tom Mintz, who at this point has won 14 rounds in a row. Let's talk to Gary Porter about that one, uh, including a final round win over Barefoot the week prior in Orlando. Frolic is looking to avenge a loss here, and Mintz is basically looking to continue a streak. And the whole shot appears to go to Bulldozer, but there is no looking back for Tom Mintz here. Tom gets around the track very quickly, leading the first time by and over the finish line by about a truck length. And with the bounce, actually pops the truck up onto the right side for a minute. It did that kind of classic mince kind of bounce back and forth, mm -hmm. right to left, and pop back up onto the sidewalls. I still think that they they purposely chose the song Dope Ride for him because of the dan the, the part where it goes right, left. Because <laughs> it's a <laughs> mince take bounce. A ride. <laughs> take a ride in the dope ride. Yeah, there you go. And once again, uh, they're going to show more than just one replay. Yeah, they show so. plenty. <laughs> they show plenty of replays right here. We get a nice ISO cam of Barefoot showing Todd Frolic's pass. Seems like Todd did get on the two wheels a little bit around the last turn, which did cost him. This time, that actually does cost somebody a win against Tom Mintz. Meanwhile, Gary Porter hiking the rear tire up for some reason. That cost him a win in the last race and our last show that we had covered. Uh, the final jump from Barefoot is a nice leap, by the way, as Frolic almost goes into the dumpster at the end of the track. He grazes it with that left front tire when he lands. I can tell you, that's, that was some heads-up driving right there from Frolic to get on the brakes really quick. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he was going to slam that dumpster. Uh, Head-on camera shot shows Bulldozer and Tom just has an absolutely fantastic final turn. And honestly, not to toot my own horn, but it reminds me a little bit of how I drive an RC truck, pivoting it off that right or left front tire when you're going into a corner. We see that done by Tom Mintz perfectly here. He pivots on that left front tire right around that pole, gets on that loud pedal to the finish line, a fantastic run from Mintz. Right, and plus people may forget that that's a truck he's been running for a while. Technically, yeah. the second Moss Patrol truck is there, um, but just with a different body on it. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's nothing new, but I guess the TNN, yeah, TNN Motor Madness, it must be new. Yeah, it's, it's a completely new truck. It's like back in the day whenever uh, Dan Rente debuted on television. He was driving Bigfoot 8. Nope, that's Bigfoot 10. Brand new Bigfoot 10. We swear it's Bigfoot mm -hmm. 10. We checked it was Bigfoot 10. We're pretty sure it's Bigfoot 10. By the way, it's Bigfoot 8. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we get Samson and Gravedigger here. And this is oh, this is going to be a long talk right here between the in this semifinal round race we got right here. Samson considered the favorite to win here, while Anderson and Digger are a threat to win at any place, any time. Scott reminds us that Dennis is determined to get that checkered flag off the back of Bulldozer, and the only way to get it is to get through Samson right here. They leave the line, and Dennis actually launches a little bit a little bit cockeyed right here. He goes launches off to the right. He's in the blue lane, obviously. So Dennis seems to be going for that wide arch so he can get that corner exit again. And Dan Patrick stays straight, and then when he gets to the turn, when he gets to the turn, he gets to the turn. Basically, that truck corners very well, while Digger Twelve needs a little bit of that arc to get around the corner. Dennis misjudges that arc though, and directly nails a turning pole. Meanwhile, in the other lane, it's very clear Samson misses a jump with the left front tire. That's the truck launches awkwardly. Samson miss does not get both front tires over the jump. In the officials' eyes. This is now one-to-one, -one, and it's still an even race. When they come back across the finish line the second time, Gravedigger is ahead of Samson, and Gravedigger is declared the winner. However, there is a replay shown right here, and this is something I did not catch in the initial pass by Dennis when they showed it on the live race of it. On the replay, you see Dennis hit the pole, and then his left front tire missing a jump. So we've got basically two-to-one now. The win should 
go to Dan Patrick. Mm-hmm. However, and this is something this has been debated by people. I saw it debated not too long ago by a few people. Um, basically said they didn't know what what happened right there. I'll tell you what happened. They called it from the floor. They didn't have a guy like me in 2020 sitting in the booth to call the race and watch for every little penalty. They had a guy on the floor calling the penalties, and I will guarantee you that guy on the floor caught the pole and he caught the jump for Samson, but he didn't catch the pole and Digger because at the time that Digger hits that pole and is coming around the corner to hit that set of cars, Samson's missing the jump in the other lane. So at that point, you need four eyeballs mm-hmm. watching it. There's no, nobody's going to go back and look at a replay on this. Let's face it. The only thing they're going to show on the replay to the live crowd is those two trucks coming across the line together. And Dan Patrick, according to Roy Jansen, basically says he Dan Patrick basically says, I won this race. I was first across the finish line. But Dan obviously doesn't know that Dennis also missed a jump. And nobody has no nobody in this broadcast mentions that Dennis misses this jump. Probably because, like I said, nobody on the floor saw it. Right, right. And now there could have been more to it also. And then maybe they wanted the the broadcast wanted to pull some strings and keep the storyboard the way it goes. So they try to do as much as they could to not show they uh, grave well, they, doing. they show it in one replay. It's a very good point you brought up there. They show it in one replay. Any of the replay after that, they cut right before he goes into the cars. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely think that, you know, this episode, the one, another reason why I picked this episode, too, was how many times they bend the rules. What was really true at this event? What was, now, you know. you saying that. The round one race with Mintz and Porter. That is one that you could literally sit back and question and give that question to. This race, with the amount of penalties that happen back to back to back right there, I can blame that on an officiating mistake. No. I I can blame that one on an officiating mistake. Mm. Because, like I said, they have one guy watching this race. One guy on the floor, again, on the floor calling this race, not up top, on the floor. I, he can't call that and catch all three of those penalties that right, happen, right. like I said, back to back to back, right there on the floor. But the broadcast knew something was up. But the broadcast knew something was up, and the broadcast makes it seem like there's something up. But they don't directly say anything about Dennis missing the jump and we see it, but we are not told about it. And, by and another thing, another thing, like with Paul Schaefer, you don't really see Dan Patrick. Out yeah, you don't. Own... You don't see Dan Patrick say anything about it. But no. Dan, according to Dan Moriarty, is upset. And ba- basically, Dan says, "Hey, I tried to talk to Dan Patrick, and he basically threw his arms in the air. No comment. I won the race. I know I won the race. Go watch the tape. I won the race." Roy Jansen almost just shrugs his shoulders here about this. He says both infractions were called on the radio. Whether it was a ball or whether it was a strike, we'll live with it. He goes on to say there is always protests. There are always conflicts in motorsport. When there are complaints where the only remedy is to run the race over again, you have to live with the decision. And that is something that I wholeheartedly disagree with. Mm-hmm. I agree. Roy shot himself in the foot in that interview, as far as I was concerned. The only remedy to this race was to run it again at this point. If there is that much discrepancy, and if, they, if Dan Patrick's throwing as much of a fit as we're being told, they need to run the race again. A prime example of this, later on, World Finals 2, Dan, Brian Bartle doesn't see the flag. They had to change the course at World Finals, too. For those people that don't know, they changed the course. It's no longer the straightaway coming down Thunder Alley because of a water main break. It's a J-drag inside of the stadium for the semifinal round. Blue Thunder gets a win over Wolverine. But when the, fla- the flag man waves the flag, he's standing too close to Wolverine. Blue Thunder sees it, and Wolverine just sits there because Bartle can't see the flagman. 
the flagman literally has to run at him waving the flag before Bartle sees it. Then he takes off. This, I believe this was on, I'm not sure if this was on the VHS tape release or not, but there's a heated discussion in the back. I had it on uh, recorded VHS from a live pay-per-view for a long time. And you could see these guys arguing and arguing and arguing. And then finally we see Bartle just take off running towards his truck. They're suiting him up. They're going to let him rerun the race. Very fair it's thing to do. What they should have probably done here, in my opinion. Now, there's also a certain situation, I'll be the devil's advocate, back when uh, it was one world finals where Tom's truck shut off down at Thunder Alley and Iron Man clearly won. But they re-ran it anyway because, you know. Yeah, but that's not retro. <laughs> right, right, right. That happened but, a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It, but anyway, my, my point here is in Monster Truck Racing, they have brought races back to be re-ran. Mm -hmm. That race at the World Finals is an example. Another example, TNT Motorsports did this in, I believe it was Memphis in 1990. Bigfoot and Equalizer re-ran a final round race, and Bigfoot eventually came out on top. Mm -hmm. If there's, Like I said, if there's this much discrepancy, what's wrong with rerunning the race again? Right. That's I, why I, I was questioning to me why this. they did not do that. That's why I was questioning about what was, you know, true and what was not. Was it for television? What was, you know, what was going on? There was so much stuff going on that, uh, that you know, the interview, you know, there was a lot of head scratching, but it is what it is, I guess. Yeah, and like I said, this interview also ends awkwardly uh, between Roy and Dan. I just... just it's just weird. Now, like I said, on to what I really think happened here. Like, like I said, I, I don't think the officials saw Anderson miss the car, miss the, the lead up jump right there. So I, I get that this was an official snafu and the rules clearly do state that if one truck has an infraction, another truck has an infraction, it's an even up race at that point. Mm -hmm. Dan Patrick coming back and saying, you know what? I won the race. Look at the replay. I was the first truck across the finish line. Not the case. And I'll tell you why it's not the case. There's a finish line pole in the center of the track that is not centered on the track. So Dan Patrick, as he's flying through the air and looking to his left and seeing there's a pole right there, he's clearly to that pole first. However, that's not the pole that we're looking at here. When they do the replay and they show the truck stopping, Dennis is ahead because there's another pole on the end of the track that does mark the center of the track. That is the clear finish line pole, and that is the pole that Gravedigger is to first. Dennis clearly is the first truck to the finish line. For some reason, they didn't set that pole in the correct spot that was supposed to be in the center of the racetrack. Gotcha, yeah. And I think that's what Dan Patrick saw. If, in fact, he did go over and say what he said to Dan Moriarty, that's up for debate in the whole world of monster truck racing. If you want to debate it, go ahead, debate it in the comments. I'll debate with you. But anyway, um, I think that's the poll that Dan sees. And that's the poll that he's making his complaint about that. He was first to, which he was first to that one. The problem is it's not centered in the track. The one that Dennis was at first is. So mm -hmm. ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, the decision is made that grave digger wins and is now in the final round. Now, what? looking at this, before we get into the rest of this, this rest of this here, Dan, had they called this penalty and had Carolina Crusher defeated Bulldozer in round number one, like probably should have been, we're looking at a completely different semifinals. It would have been Samson in the final round, taking on either Barefoot and Carolina Crusher. Yeah. That, that would have been a heck yeah. of a final round either way. Right, right. Any of those three, trucks. Three good trucks. Yeah, there's yeah. three good trucks right there. Both, uh, honestly, I think Carolina Crusher had the fastest pass around number one. He beat Tom Mintz. Number number one, he beat Tom Mintz. Number two, he beat him handily. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, he gets screwed over about that. And uh, it, 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 that's another, you know, head scratcher. You know, I just, I think, once again, with Carolina Crusher and Bulldozer, we know who won. Yeah. But that wasn't good for business. I don't want to go there. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, I don't want to go there because I, I truthfully I don't believe that. That, like I said, that first round race with Carolina Crusher and Bulldozer leaves you scratching your head, like what the heck's going on here? But they shoot themselves in the foot when they show that replay so many times on that one. 
Yeah. This particular race right here, like I said, I think it, it was legit mistake by the official that, that he did not catch the digger tire call. Mm -hmm. he, he obviously caught the pole because the pole was down. Right. He caught Samson missing, probably because after he saw the pole from Digger, he went to look and see if Samson hit the pole and he was hitting the jump. That was my guess. And he right. just completely missed Dennis missing the jump himself. There's so many information that you're going on going yeah, at the same honestly, time. You've got that... two eyes going back and forth right there. You've got one guy doing a line judge, and it's not like my advantage that I had when I was a competition manager of having several different monitors and several different chances to see a replay. It was all digital. It was right there. This is not yeah. the case in 1999. But anyway, ultimately, we're, we're eight minutes into this episode, and we've already finished the semifinals. We only got the finals to go with, and we've still got 29 minutes remaining on the broadcast. What kind of filler are we going to get? Quad Wars. Yay! <laughs> One thing I'm, I'm never going to speak kindly of is Quad Wars. We do get a really <laughs> cool uh, collision Shit. course segment right here. What are you Good. laughing at? <laughs> You're in, you're in notes. We talk about tough trucks for a good minute. We talk about monster trucks. Obviously, they're terminating form. Yeah, they're Quad truck. Wars gets no love. Quad Wars gets absolutely no love. You know why? Because of all the fake WWE fighting they have. Guys yeah. jumping over quads to try to fight each other. It makes no sense. If you see that in NASCAR, both those drivers are immediately fined. In Quad Wars, no. Eh. That's just that guy being that guy. It makes absolutely no sense. There's never any talk of any teams getting fined or anything stupid like that. Yeah. Just It's dumb. They don't even make it look like it's legitimate. But anyway, we go into a collision course segment here. Uh, and I actually really like this. We see a really good clip of Ground Pounder, an uh, old obscure truck that not many people have really ever seen, yeah. having a rollover. And then we see a couple of Predator Sky Wheelies. A quad accident that looked very violent, by the way. A nosedive. And then a corkscrew stunt that actually appears to go a little bit wrong. The, truck, the car jumps, hits the corkscrew ramp, does the corkscrew, lands in the car pad, and then just bounces out of the car pad, basically, and skids across the floor. Uh, and then we see a famous crash from Digger Number 10 where it breaks a uh, tie rod in the rear end, and you see both rear wheels fold in on each other, and Pablo has to save it. Uh, and then we're back to Quad Wars, and we're going to go ahead and skip that. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Skipping ahead, we get to the interview with Dennis and Tom, our finalists. They appear to be having fun. Uh, Anderson has a huge grin on his face when Tom says, I'm trying to think of what I want to put on that flag. I'm going to keep it till the end of the year, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, Dennis says, I tell you what, the only reason that you have that flag is because my truck broke. Uh, Buddy Rowe, you can keep it, basically, if uh, you think that's the way that you deserve that flag. I'm referring to him losing the ring and pinion in Orlando. They egg in the segment with each driver saying no excuses to each other. No excuses. We cut to some freestyle action with Bulldozer coming out on the floor, which appears to have taken place before the finals, according to the announcers. Honestly, I don't know. I'm going to assume that this was filmed after the finals, mm -hmm. as well as the Digger freestyle we're going to see in a little bit. Uh, after Tom, some of Tom's freestyle highlights, we cut to Carolina Crusher highlights. Gary's described as the king of donuts. The king of donuts goes for a donut, and as you referred to earlier, the red and yellow truck decides to take a roll over Beethoven on the top side of the floor over there. Very easy roll, though, to be perfectly honest. Compared to Houston? Yeah. <laughs> very, very light roll over. It kind of reminded me, like, when I'm, we had Cody Saucier on the show and we talked about Gary Porter rolling over Carolina Crusher number three in Memphis in 1991. Drug lands and then just easiest rollover you could possibly have. Just a little bit of body damage for Gary Porter right here. If he's lucky, maybe a little bit of cage damage. I doubt it. But uh, just made, basically looked like it tore the roof off the truck, and that was about it. Right, right. Not If you watch the rollover, it doesn't look like anything's really damaged that would have been the easy fix for him for the next event anyway exactly going into the finals here after all that filler of quad wars which skip. i honestly did not watch i skipped right over it honestly in the, my notes i typed skip with about 45 p's at the end of it because that's mm -hmm. how much i hate quad wars but anyway after all that filler we come back for commercial and what do we get talking about the final round we get dennis anderson talking about shocks <laughs> you just don't go to your local auto parts store to get these Pizzo, Mince, and Frolic all weigh in on the shocks as well. Frolic saying the funniest thing, which is, I'm the driver, man. I don't even know how the shocks work. <laughs> I love it the way you said that. That just struck me yeah. as funny. 
Obviously, I mean, Todd Frolic knows what he's talking about, but yeah. I don't think he he wanted to answer the question. Perfectly honest with you. Interesting note here is now that Anderson is in Elaney has not been in the entire night. He's in the yellow lane, and Mintz is on the blue side where he has been the entire night. Now Tom is on a quote unquote fifteen race winning streak, and we're told that he's beaten Digger twice in this streak. And then we inter- we get an interview with Tom Mintz. Dan says, hey, you took the flag last time out in Orlando. I think he wants it back. Sherlock. No blank, Sherlock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we've heard this 65 times, but anyway. Uh, Tom, you know, I think he does. I love the way Tom says that, too. It's just uh, almost a classic heel from wrestling. You know, I think he does. <laughs> he doesn't want to lose, that's for sure, but I don't either. I'm going to go out there and battle to the finish. Two tough drive, two tough, tough competitors. And ain't nobody going to be leaving anything on the track except some destroyed parts. Dan, it's going to be one heck of a final round. The fans are going to get everything they paid for. I hate statements like that because you haven't seen the race yet. Just my two cents on that. Uh, Tom, yep. Yeah, they are. People are getting people are getting rowdy here. Friday, Saturday night, whatever. Whatever night. Uh, we're going to go out there and give it our all. Then we get an interview with Dennis Anderson. You talk about it. You dream about it. You prepare yourself. The guy who stole your flag is in the finals. Mono e mono, what are you gonna do about it? I like I actually I'll give Dan Moriarty some praise right there. That was a very good way to word that question. Mm-hmm. I like that. That was a very good way to word that question. And then it says it's kind of like a dream come true right now. I want to beat him fair and square. I want to keep my cool. I want the dust. I want to dust around those turns because I've got the power. I just don't have enough room out there. Tom's good. His truck steers really well with the rear end. I'm going to give it my best shot, and all I've got to do is keep my cool and make those turns nice and easy, and I'm going to get my flag back. Dan says, is there anything you've learned about your driving on this track and on this course that you're going to change for the finals? Dennis, honestly, he's very truthful here. He says, I've tried several different styles tonight, and I still ain't nailed down to one of them. And he's right. (laughs) Dennis has been all over the place as far as what he's going to do out here on this track. The one consistent thing that he is going to do is he's going to swing wide, and we know that. They wrap that interview up, and then we finally get into the truck staging for the finals. Two entire broadcasts of an hour in length. Our final round is finally here. Anderson actually has a little bit of a lead the first time by. The second time by, he extends it by about a half a truck. And when they get to the finish line, it's all Dennis Anderson. This was actually no question, no decision-making, no nothing. Dennis beat Tom fair and square. Yeah, Dennis beat Tom fair and square, heads up. And honestly, man, that was just, uh, Tom had the perfect pass. We'll put it out there. Tom had the perfect pass in the final round. He just got beat. Mm-hmm. He just got outrove, and from the start, he was beat off the line. He got beat off the line. He was beat around the first turn, and he was slaughtered by the second turn. Dennis had the horsepower. Like I said, he was swinging a little bit wide in the corners. He wanted to use that horsepower to its fullest extent to mm-hmm. beat Tom Mintz right here, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, they, they talk about it right here at the end. They talk about how it was one-on-one, mono a mono And what I, what I find funny here is, is they've talked 15-0, and 15-0, and and Tom comes out and says, well, I came out here with the big boys, and I've ran 17-1 and one so far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it's... Another thing is when they did the interview prior to this finals, I, I think Tom was being, you know, what he's always been driving Moss Patrol, being himself. Yeah. I think later on he finds out what the what TNN wants, and then you see later on, it, like in the St. Louis World Finals, and then in the 2000 season, Tom starts realizing, okay, I'll start playing this character of a cocky dominating driver you know Mm -hmm. having the backing of goldberg and everything like that playing everyone's card of i'm this good guy and as when i say good guy i mean you know this good driver that no one can touch blah 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 this and that and but in this interview you could find you could sense tom is you know humble and he he knows what's going on he knows what's for stake and he's just going to try as best as he can. Yeah. Uh, after the final round, we get some clips of Dennis Anderson doing some freestyle out here. Uh, Dennis, being Dennis, really, doing some cross threads over the cars, some wheel stands off the backs of the cars, just tearing up the floor, really, with the Gravedigger. And it's 
Honestly, if they, if they had been judging the freestyle at the time, Dennis probably would have won, judging by some mm-hmm. of the other clips that we saw out there. He he was all over that floor. Uh, we, we get the Tom interview right afterwards, and then we go into a Dennis interview right here. Dan basically says, so you lost the flag at one. Now you got it back. No big deal, right? And Dennis, yep, there's a big deal about it. Tom got the flag because I broke, and that's what I was talking about earlier. I said, I want to get my flag back. I want to win fair and square. He don't have any excuses. I don't have any excuses. He was my Huckleberry today, buddy, Ro. That is a Dennis Anderson thing to say if I've ever heard it. I got him. I got my flag back. That's what I wanted. And then the Dan Moriartyism. And I'm just going to say, their army isms are amazing. Army Armstrong isms are amazing. And we'll talk about them for a long time on this show. <laughs> Moriarty isms. There really isn't anyone specific. You're just, as soon as I say it, you're going to know that he's going to end an interview very awkwardly. And this is one of those times. That was one heck of a final. Yeah, man, it's a small building. It's tight racing here. We ought to go. We ought, we went out there and we mounted, minded our P's and Q's. We got to drive as hard as we can. It takes good drivers to go as fast as we do. We do. TV sometimes doesn't do them justice. You just got to come in to one of these shows, come in and sit in the stands and watch us. I think you'd be amazed. The fans had a blast. Yeah, they did. And then Dennis obviously thanks the fans. Thanks, Mom, Dad, Adam, and Kristen, and Ryan, all of his kids. Dad's out here kicking on the butt, kicking ro- kicking butt on the road, and he says, "I'll be home in a little bit." And then we get the Maylocks minute, to basically end the show, saying hey, it's the Carolina Crusher rollover, which is an obvious choice for a Maylocks minute to end the show. Uh, second show I thought was much better than the first, and I think that's because I fast forwarded through a lot of it because of Quad Wars. Not afraid yeah. to admit that at all that I fast forwarded yeah. through Quad Wars. <laughs> uh, it's even better when you hear someone never first time watching Quad Wars, and then you're like, and you're trying I know. to explain it to them. You're trying to explain how this totally legitimate monster truck race is happening over here, but then there's that. Yeah, yeah, legitimacy out the window. <laughs> exactly. You know that monster truck race you saw that was totally legitimate? Watch this. Watch this <laughs> over here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm curious. What's your opinion on this show, Dan? Uh, man, I, I, there, there, there was only a few things I picked to cover this, and one um, is uh, to be honest with you, you're a smart man, knowing why I picked this show. It was one of the worst coverage, monster truck coverages I ever seen in my entire life, yeah, and I'm cool. giving it a <laughs> benefit of a four out of ten. Uh, lack. Oh, of, you changed uh, it. Now, but yes. before we started recording here, folks, Cheech was like, I'm giving it a five. I did, but then I was, like, realizing. Now he's it to a four. Well, because I watched it last night, and I watched it a few nights ago, and I was like, man, this is just terrible. This <laughs> is downright terrible. And then I give the benefit of the doubt. It was like, yeah, maybe five out of ten. And I read your notes, and then you, you and I look back, think in my head, going back and forth, and you see me. If you saw my Skype video, I've been doing a lot of head scratching. So, yes. <laughs> um, I give it a four because um, the, the the calls, the video, the calls was questionable. The 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 re, the, the four the, the reason why I give the four in general is the lineup of trucks and there was some good racing, but there that's pretty racing. much it. Like I said, there's two bad calls in here that just two shoot bad the racing. calls, yeah, and then the questioning. The the uh, Dan Lurardi, no, I mean he, he he. I would rather have um, someone that you know would be blunt on his questions than trying to ask a generic bad question and make it sound like it's a good time. And that's what he did. He made a lot of uh, awkward moments with a lot of drivers that you know it shouldn't be and. We'll put it this uh, way. Dan Moriarty ending every interview was like that awkward guy that bought a girl a drink at a bar and he just won't leave her alone or take the hint. Right, right. And still keep on giving her drinks while she's like, I'll take them, but that's all exactly. you're Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's uh, what that reminded me of. And if Dan Moriarty listens to this, I'm sorry. You sucked on this show. And your hockey team sucks, too. Oh, anyway. Hey, whoa, wait. <laughs> I didn't go there, Dan. I didn't go there. <laughs> The other Dan yeah. did. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's uh, he's somewhere in Los Angeles, so he'd be all right. But um, <laughs> another thing is, is they knew ahead of time that this 
was a smaller show compared to a stadium monster truck show. Mm-hmm. What they should have done was maybe fill in two, a night one and a night two. They could have done that. It could have been two full shows on each broadcast because yeah. they're, ob- they're obviously doing more than just one show in Nashville. Yeah, right, right. When, and I, was, they, when I was in Nashville, we did, I believe, four shows, two Saturdays, two Sundays. I'm, I'm thinking back here is a three-show weekend, one Friday and two Saturday shows. Now, I could be wrong, but uh, if yeah. you guys on the show can correct me, it was a three- or a four-show weekend. I'm leaning towards a three-show, but I could be wrong. Um, but still. There was multiple shows, and they could have filled in two programs with that, or you know maybe a one show with racing, and then experiment with what they would do for the rest of the TNN Motor Madness, have a freestyle or something like that. But I don't know. Um, But how they kind of ruined this program is trying to fill in so much entertainment for one show no one can see my quotations on this podcast He's doing the quotations folks i can i can <laughs> i can vouch for this <laughs> but i'm just saying that it was just it was just terrible but then again is but then again how many times until until this event the next time i believe you see a arena show from any form of monster jam is i think maybe a few years back when they did the triple threat tour. Yeah, and I think that there's a very valid reason as to why, and they point I'll probably point to this show as the reason why. This was very poorly produced. This mm-hmm. is like you had said earlier, this is one of the worst flag to flag coverages. And this was spent on two separate hour long broadcasts that we covered today mm-hmm. to cover an eight truck racing bracket. That is insane. The guys in the booth, Mike Hogwood, Scott Douglas, they are fine. And you can tell that they are still, at this point, the chemistry is still building between them. But that chemistry is going to be very strong. And by the end of this relationship, these two are some of the best commentators in the sport. Dan Moriarty, however, is by far one of the worst pit reporters I've ever seen. And this is coming from somebody, like you said, 12-year-old Josh. I liked Dan Moriarty when I was 12 years old. Now... I wanted to punch him. I wanted to reach to the TV screen and punch him for some of the things that he was doing. I, I want to, re, I want to go back in time and smack myself for liking him. <laughs> well, but he ends interviews awkwardly. He doesn't listen to some of the answers, like some of some of the questions that he could have had. Really good, or some of the answers he could have made into really good questions. He just comes back with generic questions and then berates the driver that gives him the generic answer, David mm-hmm. Morris. Some of the questions just come off awkwardly. Uh, his interviews, to me, they just felt weird the entire time. Some of the drivers just seem to be out of place with him, and that's never a good thing. Uh, as far as officiating on the show, I hate to throw anybody under the bus uh, about it, but at the same time, there was just there was two ridiculous calls that were made on this show. One, Actually, I take that back. There's one very ridiculous call, one very questionable call. I also have to say the call of just qualifying just a straight line is yeah, another head stretcher. You know, why can't they just qualify going round and round and then find out who gets the better time exactly. instead of just straight line? Exactly. And that's one thing that jumped out to me as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is they qualify him in a straight line, but they spend three quarters of the show talking up to the point to doing the roundy round talk. They talk roundy round, roundy round, roundy round, roundy round. And when they get to qualifying, oh, by the way, we're going to run these straight line. With no explanation whatsoever as to why earlier in the show. It made no sense to me. Uh, The major issue that, one of the major issues that I have here is the whole Tom Mintz being portrayed as a villain thing. He stole my flag. Dennis Anderson basically, honestly, when you watch this back, you almost look at Dennis as maybe a little bit of a, I hate, uh, God, I'm I'm a Digger fan. I've always been a Digger fan. I'll always be a Digger fan. I'll always be a Bigfoot fan. I'll always be a Max D fan. I'll always be a fan of Tom. But in this particular instance, and I'll always be a Scott Stevens fan. I'll say that too. But in this, he looks just about as bad to me as Scott Stevens did in 1990 after the banning of Bigfoot 8. To me, he's just, he's crying in this show. He's whining about how much he wants that flag. I broke. That's the only reason he has it. 
I broke. That's the only reason he has. He says it multiple times in this show. They're portraying him to look like a hero in this show. And to me, he just comes off as, I don't know. You, he just comes, it just comes off bad. It just mm-hmm. the whole, the whole thing between him and Tom, as fun as they look like they're having more power to it. They look like they are having a blast talking to each other, but they make them try and be like hero and villain in this show. And it, it just, it comes off totally wrong. They portray it the wrong way. They do much better of this in later years in TNM Motor Madness. But here, they, they do not do a good job. And I believe I'm being generous when I give this show a three. Mm. Very generous. Yeah, like I said in the, the previous, uh, prior to it, I don't think Tom knew about it. And also, I think you also watched Dennis's interviews, too. And this, I don't think he was taking it seriously. You know, I'm, I'm agree, I'll agree with you there. The whole part about him stealing my flag and stuff like that. You can see he's grinning when he says that. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he's just saying that because Tom's probably around him at some point behind the camera as now, he's talking. Now, you want to see a heated, you want to watch a heated argument between the two. Watch the race between them two at St. Louis later that year. Yeah. When they, are, when they penalize Tom for going two wheels and his father gets into it. So... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and that's that right there. You saying that is exactly why I don't believe. And there, there are some instances, and this was actually brought up not too long ago in another Facebook discussion. Not going to name any names, but some people were trying to say that this show was completely rigged. If this show is rigged, then why is Tom Mintz's dad jumping into the fight in St. Louis later in the season? Why, why is there such an argument right here? It makes mm-hmm. absolutely no sense to me. I don't I don't I don't see why anybody would think that this was fixed or rigged for Dennis Anderson and Gravedigger to win this event or to win any other events in the season. It makes no sense as to why they would do that. Because let's face it, Dennis can win events on his own. And he's proven that many, many times over the years. Same with Gary Porter, same with Todd Frolic, the same with Tom Mintz, the same with Paul Schaefer, every guy in this in this show, Alan Pizzo, David Morris, all guys that have won in top tier monster racing competition. Yeah, this was a for for this year outside of one truck, let's just say it, Bigfoot, the field has been stacked like this since 1996 since Monster Wars to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. The, all the same trucks you would see there outside of, you know, you can't you can't have two monster patrols. So you obviously have to give Tom another identity and and because he was monster patrol like we said before. Mm-hmm. He wasn't. Um, and uh, the lineup was always going to be that way. That 1999 year, Dennis was on the rail. He was hard to beat. He was very and hard there to was, beat. There, I don't think there was a lot of penalties or uh, gimmies that Dennis was getting. He was winning straight up. The only time yeah. that he was screwing up was on himself. Or his truck was breaking. Or he rolled over during freestyle. And it took him all week to get the truck back and running yeah. because of cage damage and stuff like that. And so pretty much anyone that was taking Dennis on, I mean, you had to bring your lunch back because I don't think Dennis was going to lose unless he did it to himself. So 99 was just straight up. And I wish Monster Jam give credit to that championship. Yeah. They, they feel like that 2000 was the start of this – thing when all along i believe 99 if you're gonna say world finals was say you even put it you even they put it on the dirt world finals you even they, put they it on the dirt world finals. in 99 like you said they put it on the dirt world finals in the dirt some i knew they put it somewhere in the dirt i mm-hmm. whatever but anyway they even said it world finals 99 count it as it you know say dennis is a five-time world champion well, yeah. one thing that I'll point out is earlier this year when I went to one of the St. Louis Monster Jam shows, because they had a show in St. Louis this year. They had three shows. I went to one of them, the Saturday night show, and they talked about, they called it World Finals Zero. They talked about the first World Finals being there. They talked about Jim Kohler being one of the trucks that was at that show, Avenger. Ironically, yeah. Kohler went on to win his first and second stadium racing championships that year or that season or this year. Ugh, listen to me. I'm talking like he won it in 99. <laughs> but Kohler went on to win two of the three racing brackets that particular weekend. And I thought that was kind of cool. 
because we had a truck that was there. Well, not the same truck, but the same named truck that was there in 1999. And they're talking, they're finally acknowledging the first, the first world finals held in that building. And a truck that was there goes out and steals a racing win over the top trucks in the country. I thought that was very cool. Uh, I thought that it was nice that they were finally giving that particular event the justice that it really deserved. Oh, okay, okay, because I I didn't know they did that, but the, but for the longest time they just ignored it. Yeah, and yeah. they ignored it, they ignored it, and they ignored it. But beginning of the show, they were talking about the World Finals, and uh, they actually uh, believe it was Rachel Hagen, DJK Young, says uh, Brian Womack won racing. Brian Womack and Barefoot wins racing at the mm. first World Finals, and they they acknowledged it at that show. Anybody that was there can vouch for me that that was said, and it was something that was a very nice piece of history, and I'm glad that they said it. That is pretty cool. I, I didn't know that, but, like, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool that they finally gave props to it. So if they say that, then Dennis and Gravedigger should be a five-time world champion. They should. They should add another championship onto Gravedigger. Just like they should count the points championship that Adam won not too long ago, and the points championship Morgan Kane won, and I believe they should also add the championships that they won in the World Finals with Grave Digger. Remember that year when both Grave Diggers won, both you know Adam won uh, freestyle and I think Morgan Kane won racing. I believe they year. did add those, but honestly, to get to get back, then just wrap this show up right here. Uh, like we said, you gave it a, a four, I gave it a three, and I still think it's very generous at a three. I'd almost want to go to a point to two point five, really, because there was good racing, but those two bad calls just set the whole racing apart for me. Uh, I'll leave the, the rest of the discussion up to you fans out there. We've gone on for a really long time. I knew this was going to be a long episode just from how much was being thrown at us in this episode that we had to talk just, about. Yeah, I just thought of, you know, the one thing I thought, too, when I threw this at you was not all the Monster Truck review in Monster Truck television was good Monster Truck racing or good programs. Sometimes yeah, you got to we've, we've the covered nitty-gritty. plenty of good shows on here. We've covered some bad ones. But this one right now, I, this is like <laughs> my number one worst one that I've had to cover. And uh, when you were over here, last, not last weekend, the weekend before, uh I remember just looking at you, shaking my head, going, "Man, this this one's gonna be rough." <laughs> but yeah, but, it's, it's I, but I, be, you saw my fun. face, and you saw my face, and I was like, "Yeah, it's gonna be rough." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, hey, we I got mean, through it, man. I appreciate you being on the show. I know you've probably got to get to bed here soon. We're recording this on a Tuesday night, and it's literally four minutes away from a Wednesday now. So. <laughs> I hope everybody enjoyed it. I know it's a nice long episode for you. A lot of you guys like to binge watch these and just listen to them for a long time. So this is a good one for a car trip. But anyway, also, uh, we will... Before you go, sorry, go Josh. Ahead. Can I plug in the RC event? Yeah, go right ahead. Go right July, ahead. Uh, July. Dang it. November 20th, uh, 2021. Uh, the Hall Brothers, which I'm a crew member of also, um, catch me on the ride truck. Uh, <laughs> we are... Um, um, doing a little micro open house, but I am hosting an RC event uh, with the Trigger King rules. It will be on a Facebook page. Come out, see us. Uh, we'll have a couple of people. Um, uh, you know, Zach Gardner from the Wild Side, John Zimmer Jr. from Turbo Velocity, Jamie Gardner's crew. Uh, Freestyle RC will be there. Uh, a couple of Josh will be there. Uh, a lot of the guys from Trigger King that you would see on YouTube that's going to be racing. Uh, Trailer Trash RC is going to be there also. Uh, a few we're going to have some giveaways, uh, some um, uh, awards, and uh, some raffles. Uh, Raminator will be on display, tired up. So go check out that truck. Uh, merchandise. Uh, take a look at the Hall Brothers shop. Doors open at 7.30. Racing starts between 9 and 9.30. Um, also, uh, we will have, uh, uh, there's a fee. So first truck's about $10. The truck's after that, $5. Um, also want to thank uh, Trigger King for donating the ramps, too, for this event. Uh, Ju- uh, November, why keep on saying July? I'm sorry. November 20th, 2021. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to probably call it the Hall Classic. But um, 
yeah, come out, guys. If you listen to this podcast, you're around the Champaign area. It's the weekend after the Hall of Fame. So if you have something to do <laughs> the week after the Hall of Fame and you're an RC racer or your average monster truck uh, fan that loves monster trucks, especially uh, the Hall Brothers, they have tons of history, and uh, it's cool to see what their operation's like. Come out and check it out and uh, have yeah, a good a time. It's a cool shop to go tour around, too. There's a lot of stuff hanging on the walls in there that's just a piece of monster truck history, really, when you walk around. Some original executioner stuff hanging in there as well. Uh, some photos of Big Boss that you wouldn't see anywhere else or on that in there. It's it's something cool. I'm glad every time I get to go up there, I get to see it and be a part of it. And you never know who you're going to see when you show up at the Hall Brothers shop as well. Uh, watching Mark Hall walk around and then just b BS with, with him about the, the new truck that you guys are building over there too. One of the coolest experiences I've had this year. And I'm mm -hmm. glad we're going to be coming up there on the 20th. I can't wait to be a part of it. Uh, might throw, might try and do something retro monster truck review related for it. May sponsor the retro class. I don't know yet. We'll talk about that down the road. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all enjoyed it. And we will see you guys again on the tracks across America.